bringing data from one entity to another is uh, usually not that easy as it should be. So um, what we are trying to achieve in ATLAS is to increase the interoperability between machine sensors and data services. That's uh, very briefly uh, summarized. Um, and uh, yeah, how, how we are going to do this is that we have uh, we need a standardized and extensible interface for data exchange. So we see interoperability as uh, the ability to exchange data uh, between all the entities involved. And um, what we also uh, are trying to achieve is that uh, we have a, a full control over the data through through the farmer. So what we have done so far in Atlas is that we developed uh, this interoperability architecture. We are currently at, at a state where we can uh, already do some uh, first implementations of this architecture. So the, uh, the concepts here are that we have trusted in autonomous participants, uh, a minimum of centralized components, and uh, that we uh, are, are realizing a data exchange through dedicated uh, connectors, which we call services. Um, in this uh, architecture, we have basically two concepts uh, for data exchange. We have uh, a data platform-based exchange and processing, which you, which you can, can see here. And we are also addressing onboard computing, on-site computing, edge computing, and processing capabilities, which are then also interconnected to the whole network and also can exchange data to the, to the uh, platform-based, cloud processing-based uh, uh, participants of the network. Um, all the uh, architecture is designed along concrete use cases and was developed in a collaborative uh, development process between industry partners, software developers, and agricultural service providers. Um, we are addressing multiple sensors and data analysis functionalities in Atlas. You see here a brief overview of uh, what uh, we are doing in the respective work packages. Uh, looking at the time, I will not go into much detail about this. Um, we are also dealing with uh, hardware development, uh, here to mention the, the multi-sensor box, which is uh, uh, integration of multiple sensors in, in one, uh, yeah, one box, so to say, which uh, can be uh, attached to an agricultural machine using the, the standard connectors and also the standard connectors for exchanging data with the machine. Um, as I said, we have uh, multiple farms as part of the consortium. Uh, we have in total uh, 13 agricultural operations available to the consortium. Uh, where all kinds of, of uh, fruits, arables uh, are planted and also livestock farming is, uh, is a, a major part in, in that setup. Um, these uh, these uh, farms are part of the pilot studies, um, which are distributed all over, over Europe. And uh, we defined a multitude of use cases, uh, which will be then uh, uh, demonstrated on these pilot test sites. We have the, the, the classical precision farming um, approaches, but we also are dealing with irrigation, with soil analysis, with livestock behavior analysis, and also multi-fleet, uh, multi-vendor fleet management and asset tracking. So to summarize it, uh, Atlas is trying to uh, achieve a new level of interoperability between machine sensors and data services. Uh, what we have so far is a, a reference architecture with a minimum, uh, minimal amount of centralized uh, central components. Uh, we are currently working on uh, uh, concrete implementations to have uh, some first demonstrators ready as soon as possible. So that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very, very much for that, Stefan. And um, next, I'd like to introduce Kevin Doolan. He's our Director of Innovation here at the Telecommunication Software and Systems Group at Waterford Institute of Technology. Kevin has been leading technical projects now for over 20 years and has worked in academia governmental and industry contexts. He is the coordinator of Demeter and he'll give a brief overview of the project. Kevin? Okay, um, 
Hi everyone, uh, as I said, my name is Kevin Doolan. I'm the Director of Innovation in the Telecommunications Software and Systems Group in Waterford Institute of Technology. Uh, just before I start the main presentation, I just want to say a few thank yous um, on behalf of myself and Stefan. Uh, just firstly, thanks to Deirdre and Grania uh, from TSSG for organising the logistics around the webinar. Uh, thanks Hazel as well for acting as our MC for the, for the day. Uh, Hazel is our strategic business partner for Agri Research in TSSG, so if you need to know about TSSG Agri work, uh, she's the person to talk to. Uh, also, um, I want to thank Joel and Doris uh, from the Commission for giving their time and, and opening the event. Uh, and finally, I want to thank the, actually the Demeter Project team. Uh, they've been working extremely hard uh, over the past few weeks and months, uh, and we had quite a good first review this week. Um, with the with the European Commission and the, the reviewers. <clears throat> so just a, a quick note on the uh, the TSG itself. Uh, TSG was founded in 1996, and um, we really have our history in in EU projects, actually starting back in Framework Five. Uh, we're a full research life cycle centre, which means uh, we cover the full research spectrum from basic science all the way through to commercialisation. Uh, at the heart of our organization, we're all about researching core technologies and, and enablers, such as artificial intelligence, augmented reality, virtual reality, data analytics, and so on, and then applying these to different verticals, uh, and in this case, uh, agriculture. So Demeter, uh, as you probably know at this stage from the, the presentations earlier, Demeter is, is essentially a sister project to Atlas. Uh, we were both funded under DTICT09. Um, we're a 60 partner project uh, spread across 18 countries in Europe and Demeter is all about enabling interoperability across the full agri value chain, uh, particularly at a, a data level, which you're going to hear a, a, lot, a lot about today in the, the detailed presentations to follow. To verify the results of, of Demeter, we've got 20 different pilots, which are spanning five agricultural sectors. Um, we also firmly promote the multi-actor approach and as such we have a network of about 6,000 farmers that are engaging with the project um, and we also have involved the, the World Farmers Organization so we can extend our dissemination uh, actually on a global scale as well. Uh, the slide here just gives some examples um, of our pilots just to show you the types of things we're, we're investigating within the project. Um, and you can get more details on all of these on our, our project website. Uh, but just as an example, um, for example, we've got water and energy management uh, pilots related to arable crops. So looking at things like smart energy management in irrigated crops or optimal rice irrigation. We have pilots on precision farming, again related to arable crops, where we look at in-service agricultural machinery condition monitoring. Uh, we look at data brokerage services, decision support systems, and so on. We also deal with uh, crop health and quality in the fruit and vegetable sector. Uh, and as an example here, we're looking at implementation of decision support systems um, for olive growers. Uh, on the animal health side, we have a lot of work going on in the area in, in the area of dairy and meat production, where we produce dashboards uh, for those various supply chains. Uh, and also we have um, cross-sectoral um, pilots, which kind of cover the whole supply chain. So for example, we've got a pollination optimization in apiculture, or we've got pilots that are about enabling transparency in the poultry industry uh, supply chain. Uh, you'll hear a lot more about our, our multi-actor approach um, and our technology approach uh, as the day progresses. So I'm not going to go into details on that in this presentation. Um, just to give a quick note on, on where we're at at the moment in terms of the project, uh, we started in September 2019. Um, our multi-actor approach is, is fully underway. Um, we have gathered our initial requirements. We have our initial reference architecture ready. And again, you'll hear about that uh, in the following presentations. Um, some of the piloting work is starting, albeit there has been some delays um, due to COVID-19. Uh, essentially, it's, it's not easy to get people to go out and, and visit other people in an agricultural setting and deploy technologies and so on, but now that's easing, uh, so things are going to start ramping up. 
Uh, and we're preparing our open calls, and I know there's a presentation a little bit later on about open calls where you can see how you can get involved in Demeter and Atlas and other projects as well. Um, just a few links then on the bottom. You have the link there to our uh, Demeter website where you can get a lot more detail on our pilots. Um, and then we've got Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, and YouTube as well, where we're rolling out uh, a series of video explainers um, about the project. Um, and that's me, short and sweet. I'll, 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 I'll stop there and let you get on with the more detailed uh, presentations. Thanks. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you. And we just do have a quick question for Stefan, actually, um, which is, um, Stefan, are you there? Yes, I've seen the question now. I mean, I can answer it here. Uh, Atlas will run until uh, September 20, uh, 2022. That's the, the current plan. Maybe we'll go for an extension uh, also due to COVID-19. Um, it is open to partners through the open calls, which will be introduced by my colleague uh, Tamara Neidenova this afternoon. Um, that's the answer. Okay. And Hazel, I might jump in because I see a question there on a similar question um, for Demeter. So again, Demeter is a 42-month project. Um, the question is, when is the Demeter open call? Uh, it's going to be just after the summer, and we have a presentation again in the afternoon session with, with details of, of how you can find out about that and what's going to be involved as well. Uh, we have two open calls in the project. So this is our, our first one launching uh, this year. Great. Great, thank you very much for that, Kevin, and, and to Stefan as well. Um, just to remind everybody again that there is a question functionality, and if you post the questions in there, they'll be uh, directed uh, to the presenter. If the questions are done during the presentation, the presenter will actually answer publicly, and if they're done after or during another presenter's presentation, the presenter that you're um, looking for the question to be answered by will actually answer privately online to you. If you could put the person's name that you're directing the question to, that would be great. Um, and not to worry, if we do run out of time with regards to the questions, we are uh, keeping a bank of them and we will answer them after the webinar. Also to note, the webinar is being recorded today as well, and the presentations and the recording will be sent to all of the participants afterwards. Thank you very much to, to uh, Joelle, Doris, uh, Kevin and Stefan, just to, to give us an overview of the project or the, the webinar for today. We're now moving along to the technology piece um, for today, and I'd like to introduce Professor Ayanna Borowski, um, and she is the Demeter Work Package 2 leader on data and knowledge, and the leader of the task on the Demeter Reference Architecture Design. In the last 20 years, she's participated in over 20 EU research projects, which, where she has held key technical or management roles. Her research interests are in IoT, communications, AI, and data engineering. Ayana will outline the Demeter reference architecture. Ayana? Okay, uh, morning to everybody from me as well. Uh, there is a very, this is a very short presentation trying to give you uh, a rough idea of what the Demeter reference architecture is about. Uh, first of all, a quick overview of the Demeter objectives. Uh, as uh, uh, Kevin mentioned earlier on, one of our main uh, focus here is to support interoperability on uh, various levels, uh, syntactic, uh, semantic, technical interoperability. And uh, this is achieved via the uh, data modeling, the common data modeling uh, approach that, that we have uh, implemented. Uh, these facilities are available uh, via uh, the uh, interoperability space that, that we provide. We use open standards and everything is coupled with security and privacy protection uh, mechanisms. Uh, the, the central uh, entity in our approach is the farmer, uh, which we aim to uh, empower so that he gains control over uh, his own uh, data and even uh, manage to make some uh, money out of uh, the resources he wishes to make available to external parties. We have built the necessary business models to, to support this. Uh, also, in order to support the farmer, we have built um, a benchmarking uh, mechanism 
uh, as well as uh, uh, a system that enables stakeholders to directly interact uh, to one another, uh, exchange views, and uh, uh, be able to select the most uh, appropriate solution for their needs. So the goal here is to reverse the relationship between uh, suppliers and, uh, and farmers to the benefit of the farmer always. And uh, uh, everything aforementioned is uh, demonstrated via a series of pilots. As, as Kevin mentioned, we have uh, 20 pilots built around five clusters. And uh, this is uh, about to start. Our first uh, round of pilots is about to start. You will hear later on about this in, in uh, following presentations. Uh, in order to accomplish these objectives, there are a few main concepts that our architecture is built upon. The dashboard you see here is the sole uh, entry point for all stakeholders to our system. Uh, the uh, stakeholder, the SOX, the stakeholder open collaboration space here, uh, is to be used by farmers, uh, agronomists, uh, service advisors that uh, uh, wish to exchange views and participate in the co-creation process that we make available via Demeter. Uh, on the other hand, we also offer a dedicated space, the EIS, the Agricultural Interoperability Space, that is actually to be used by uh, developers, by service providers, by people that want to build something based on Demeter and offer it to end user. Uh, the main facility uh, it offers is, of course, as its name suggests, interoperability, but it's not only that. I will elaborate further later on in the presentation. The heart of uh, Demeter is the Demeter Enabler Hub. This is where uh, every resource that is compatible to Demeter resides. Every uh, such resource that can be uh, a, a a plain sensor, a piece of software, an entire system like a platform or a machinery has a representation via, in the Demeter Enabler Hub. Uh, and via this, it is uh, discoverable by any uh, external party that wishes to, to, to make use of it. Um, so th these are the main concepts of the Demeter reference architecture. How we built this? Well, we followed uh, a typical approach, a typical methodology that's based on well-known standards for architecture design. Of course, we, we didn't build it from scratch. We uh, first uh, reviewed the state of the art related reference architecture coming from various domains, the IoT domain, Internet of Things domain, big data domain, industrial domains, and of course, uh, sector-specific solutions coming not only from the smart farming sector, such as uh, IOF 2020 solutions or data bio, but also coming from other uh, domains, the, the health domain, smart factories, and so on. Uh, and driven by the Dimitri view uh, vision and uh, Dimitri objectives, uh, also considering the stakeholder requirements that uh, came from uh, our pilots uh, and their respective use cases. We came up with over 30 requirements uh, classes uh, under which we identified uh, over 500 technical requirements. The Dimitri reference architecture addresses all these. Uh, I mentioned before the hub, the Demeter Enabler Hub, which is core to our architecture. Uh, I repeat that it, this is like uh, an open marketplace where uh, Demeter compatible resources are made available. In order for that to, to uh, be applicable, we need a Demeter enhanced entity to represent every uh, uh, platform, thing, service or application 
that uh, uh, wishes to, to be discoverable via our system. Uh, we use here the, the Dimitri provider and Dimitri consumer uh, blocks based on the IDS uh, well-known approach. And uh, underlying, we have some Dimitri core enablers that are provided by the system um, that uh, cover uh, the mandatory, let's say, functionality that needs to be in place by any resource that wishes to, to be registered in our hub in the Dimitri Enabler Hub. This spans from communication and networking facilities, uh, functional and semantic interoperability facilities, of course, security and privacy, and uh, needless to say that wrapped uh, in, in the core enablers, we have uh, the Dimitri uh, Hub client, the Dimitri Enabler Hub client. You see here a reference of the Dimitri data model. This is no other from the Dimitri AIM, the agricultural information model uh, that uh, covers uh, the, the, it's a common data model that wishes to bridge the gap between uh, the, the rich and the very diverging solutions that exist currently in the smart agri or in the agri-food domain regarding data modeling. Uh, in order to build this, we have uh, examined uh, all available solutions and uh, uh, we built our uh, model based on uh, standards that have uh, wide penetration in the market right now. Uh, it is uh, following a layered approach. Uh, so we have uh, in the upper layer, we have our core meta model that's built on the ETSI standard NGSI LD. Below that, we have a cross-domain uh, ontology level that also is built on well-known uh, ontologies such as uh, uh, SOSA uh, SSN. Uh, oh, uh, can you still see my screen? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, for me, it's, 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 it's black right now. Okay, uh, W3C ontologies and um, uh, other well-known uh, standards. In, in the third layer, we have uh, domain-specific solutions coming from the smart uh, agri-food domain always. Uh, and uh, this, again, is, is built on uh, ontologies that... Uh, um, enjoy uh, dominance in the agri-food domain, such as uh, SARA for Agri, or uh, the agri uh, data models coming from Fiverr, or uh, the Inspire Foodie ontology, and so on. On a vertical layer here, you see uh, the meta uh, data uh, support that we provide that is also built on uh, uh, standards. It's standardized solution. Uh, we have chosen to build uh, our model here on W3C DCAT, uh, as well as the uh, IDS model for uh, metadata schema. And on the lower layer uh, underlying IM, we have the semantic enablers that we provide. You see here uh, blocks uh, with uh, labels of uh, well-known standards that we provide uh, compatibility with. These are actually um, translators or, or um, wrappers that uh, are exploited so that uh, the, the data modeled uh, using these are, uh, can be converted easily to our Dimitri AI model and uh, vice versa. Uh, this is uh, an overview of the Dimitri uh, advanced enablers. The aforementioned core enablers are, as I said, mandatory. And if you want to be able to uh, communicate with a Dimitri system in order to either consume or uh, provide your own resources, uh, you have to, to uh, implement this for sure. But there are also some optional, we call them advanced enablers, that are offered by the system, 
and uh, if necessary, uh, the interested stakeholders can uh, make use of this as well. Uh, these uh, cover not only um, data and knowledge uh, enablers with enhanced functionality such as uh, knowledge extraction, machine learning, data integration, fusion, data quality control, and so on. Uh, but also uh, decision support, benchmarking and performance uh, monitoring enablers, you see in the middle horizontal layer. Uh, also service management facilities, service integration facilities, device management facilities in the integrated delivery enabler uh, layer. And everything again is coupled with the necessary data security and uh, governance enablers that uh, we provide that among others. Uh, support uh, authorization, authentication, traceability, uh, facilities, and so on. This is a high-level view of how uh, the Demeter Reference Architecture instantiation looks like. Here you see uh, the resources that are provided uh, outside Demeter, but which to, to be registered or to be compatible uh, with uh, our, our system. To do this, as I said, uh, they need to, to implement the Demeter uh, provider. Here, this is uh, indicated like uh, as a pink uh, triangle, you see. Uh, various uh, communication protocols are uh, supported. On the layer above, we have the uh, agricultural interoperability uh, space, the AIS that I aforementioned, that offers all these uh, advanced enablers, of course, the, the core enablers as well. Um, and on the upper layer, we have the applications, the Dimitri enabled applications that have been used uh, using the, these enablers offered uh, by the hub, offered by our system. The users of the applications, as I aforementioned, via the dashboard, they can access the, the hub and discover the applications that are suitable for them, and the system can advise uh, which of the applications or resources provided in Demeter is more suitable for them. This concludes my presentation. It was very short. I tried to give a brief overview of what we're aiming for here. I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ayana. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, the next presenter that I'd like to introduce is Athanasis Palikadas uh, from Intrasoft um, International. He is the coordinator of the Data Bio Lighthouse project and the integration <laughs> management of the meter. Until 2014, he worked at the Helenki Aerospace, heading out the satellite and space department. And between 2014 and 16, he led the Akazu infrastructure and research team. Since 2017, he worked at Intersoft International. He will present today on how Demeter takes its reference architecture to provide a core reference implementation in order to support its pilot implementations and beyond. Thanasis? Thank you, Hazel. I'm Continue now on uh, after Ioana's presentation on how uh, you can see my screen, right? Just to verify. Yes, I can see your screen and just watch the talk about Sorry, thank you. <laughs> uh, so, the or how to to the, all these items and elements and the concepts that we design we de defined uh, in the reference architecture of Demeter, how we go about to implementing them and taking further towards the piloting. So just, this is also also by Ioana, on the left hand, just a reminder, on the left hand side we have the collaboration space for all the stakeholders, on the left hand side the integration space for the developers, the neighbor hub uh, in the middle with all the interfaces at the top, and how do we go about arraying them, right? So in this picture, so you see also the main, what they mainly include, so the collaboration space, collaboration space includes mostly the catalog of the stakeholders, the tools available to collaborate, and the knowledge how it's been, it's been accumulated and managed in this space. The neighbor hub, in essence, includes the users, the resources that have been available through the hub to everybody, to these users, 
and the access control that they have these users to these resources. So it, it covers licensing and all this kind of uh, accesses. The application space on the right hand side uh, includes all the tools to provide and uh, facilitate the integration, uh, continuous integration and continuous development of uh, the Demeter applications. And it also includes uh, the project service environment for the runtime support. So when you run something, what you expect to see is something like that. We have a set of Demeter enhanced entities, as Joanna was presenting them, that they coordinate through the project service environment and they talk to each other. And this is the, what Joanna said, that all these, uh, we have standard wrappers that uh, provide common interfaces for all of them to facilitate better interoperability and integration, and easier integration. Right? And uh, of course, as again you want to present it, this, the common language everything is talking about is uh, the right? uh, semantic data model. And what constitutes a Demeter application is a set of this. It's the cycle is a set of Demeter enhanced entities talking with each other and coordinated through a broker service environment. And the users, of course, are all, all the uh, stakeholders from the agri farmers, farmers, solution providers, any kind of okay. so, uh, user of the demand application. So this is all how this whole thing arrived. Now, the next thing, is, thing to present is how do we go about the pro our approach of implementing uh, all these concepts? So what we do is we first provide a reference implementation. So in our central cloud, the Dimitri, say the Dimitri central cloud, we will be offered the SOX, the, the hub, but also a reference implementation of the proxy service environment and of uh, some main Dimitri enabled uh, uh, entities. Right. So this is the reference implementation. In the simple case, we expect each pilot in Demeter to make a copy in their own infrastructure and their own, and their own an independent uh, application by copying the broker service environment and deploying their own Demeter enhanced entities, following the paradigm, of course, from the reverse implementation. Right. So this allows uh, both uh, the pilots to both uh, uh, get sovereignty and ownership uh, of the, their implementation and provide uh, credible feedback back to the reference of what to improve and what to do. We do a lot, of course, um, implementations where the pilots uh, will use the central worker service environment. So they, in, in the complex case, they will use the central broker service, uh, service environment in the cloud, some uh, Dimeter enhanced entities functionalities also available in the cloud, and they may be complement them um, by their own Dimeter enhanced entities deployed at their, uh, closer to the field or their own infrastructure. Okay. So this kind, this kind of approach allows us to provide um, a lot of flexibility. First, we, by having these two, two label, levels of implementations, it's easier to get feedback from one to the other and uh, migrate features from one to the other. Important features that are cross-pilot, for example, can migrate from pilot implementations to the reference implementation. It also allows uh, la supports large number of uh, deployments. So for one extreme, if you go for extreme, but a pilot may only use the cloud element because it goes from the business model where you have only on-demand cloud uh, service, right? To the other extreme is where the pilot deploys on their, on their location is to uh, complete a kind of a license deploy, uh, a standalone deployment with a license base or whatever kind of business models be chosen. So this approach allows us to provide both a complete a concrete implementations through the reverse implementations, uh, but also allow full flexibility for any kind of business models we decide to pursue in Demeter. 
Now going a little bit on, on the implementation of the main components that I showed earlier, this, the broker service environment is, uh, let's say it's a typical microservices based, uh, high end of course, microservice based framework. Uh, the team that has the entities, they will authenticate and then they will be able to register, discover each other and provision uh, services through the, this environment. Yeah. They will talk with each other after, after of course, uh, uh, registering and uh, provisioning uh, with uh, the server, the brokerage server, they will talk with each other uh, either directly through and we do allow and, and also the public subscribe pattern of uh, talking to each other because this is also a very popular and very uh, modern kind of approach where you publish and subscribe to, let's say, data pipelines. And consider this uh, MQTT or Kafka, this kind of pipelines. The, the, this is the implementation of the security uh, server, uh, which allows for authentication and uh, authorization and information audit capabilities. This is being used by both the Nebular Hub and the Cochrane uh, Service Environment, and as well by the, all the Demeter entities and has it through their enablers to authenticate and register and get access. And uh, also in development, we have the Dimmel Enabler Hub. As you see, it has the interfaces, it's dashboards. Then it, uh, it uses a compatibility checker from the integration space, which provides, uh, certifies that the component that is about to be registered is compatible to, uh, to the Demeter guidelines, and then the facilities to manage and discover the resources, these components have been added and cataloged in the Demeter marketplace in this hub. Right? And on the right hand side, you see, of course, on the top of the security of the users' right, accounts, and then how we handle the modules that handles the resource grant allocations to the users, from the users to the users, for the resources. The SOCs is also under development with the stakeholder catalogs, a set of uh, success stories, collaboration tools, knowledge management, some experimental facilities, and all this innovation space that, uh, and all this will be available, available for us through universal searches and workflows and KPIs. Under development, of course, are the enablers. I'm not going to Describe them again, Johanna presented them very well. They provide the added value to the reference implementation, right? All these extra functionalities that are being offered by Demeter to over the third party components. And of course, the, the common lagos that Johanna presented this as well. This is the development. So, just to show a roadmap. We are in the first iteration now, over, over the two iterations to have uh, implementation. We started by doing a state-of-the-art analysis, by gathering all the existing technology assets that are available through the partners, but also on the market and as open source. We gathered all the pilot requirements from the 20 pilots that we have, and we also compiled a set of pilot platform requirements for the Dimitri platform requirements. And all this led to the reference architecture that you only presented that is completed, the version one is delivered. The agriculture formation model that's also completed, and these two have a led and all this uh, guiding the reference implementation, which is now in progress, to be completed in the next weeks. And uh, in one month time or more, a little more, it will start being used in the pilots and we will start getting feedback from them. Just two minutes now, uh, Thanos. I'm done. Any questions? Great, thank you. Um, we might actually just hold the questions until Arne has presented. Uh, just so if you could just outline that would be great. No problem, of course. I will turn off my video. Perfect. So the next presenter that I'd like to introduce is Volker Zippel from Class. And um, Volker Zippel is the product owner of the API products of the Class Group and is leading the sub team for the Atlas Work Package Three. Volker today will outline the Atlas high-level architecture. 
Volker. Thank you for having me here. Thank you for the invitation. I'm uh, about to um, give more details about the uh, current uh, stages of the Atlas reference architecture for uh, the Atlas project and where we are at the moment. Um, you have seen this slide before. It was already shown by uh, Stefan, but I just want to remind you again what we're doing here at the moment. Um, our high-level architecture at the moment is... Uh, uh, Talker, it's not in presentation mode. It's your edit mode, so we might switch around the screens. Okay, sorry. So, I mean, we, oh, there, we see your... It should yeah, only be on one screen screen anyway. Well, then I'll change that to this. This should work. Give me a minute. Just have to tell my computer what I want to have from him. So here we go. So now perfect. it should be there. Yes, yeah, perfect. Uh, now I only have to make him show it me to me as well. One second. So okay, here we go. Um, yes, there we are again. The Atlas uh, interoperability high-level architecture for the moment, okay. Um, what we are aiming in the uh, Atlas project and one of the biggest um, issues that we have for the moment or the biggest, uh, let's say, challenges is we have a very complex um, um, pattern of use cases and a very complex um, solution room, which actually spans from uh, solutions of data platforms, from infield sensors, sensor platforms, something that actually runs in the barn, livestock management, et cetera, et cetera. So we have, we have a very broad approach for things that we have to, or what we're trying to get onto one head with the technology and an interoperability network that actually uh, enables all the participant to um, <clears throat> be able to uh, bring in their data and bring in the services that they want to actually provide in the network. So um, the for the moment, our biggest approach is that we have two um, big parts actually complementing each other, which is the one for all the data platform and the exchange and processing and one for everything that's happening on board with computing and processing abilities uh, in, an, uh, in something that actually can attached, can be attached to like anything that actually can produce data for us, which is interesting. Um, these, uh, oh, oh, let's, let's be here. Where, um, in the end, these two big approaches are divided in the mesh network. Ones for the services that actually uh, will connect like every solution and data platform or should be connect every solution and data platform that we have in the business at the moment. And the second is all around things that we can want to put in the bar. And I will come to the mesh network first. What you see here is a very small and very uh, aggregated picture of what we actually think would happen in the end. We have one central component for the ne mesh network approach here, uh, which is the service registry, which we actually would um, like describe as a big address book for everyone in the network to actually uh, be in the uh, position to find each other and to find others to um, connect to. Then you have all the participants around it and what you see here is there we have participants that are already connected to the registry and we have uh, pretty much blue arrows um, between the participants directly. So what we are aiming for is uh, that the participants in the end should always be talking to each other like in a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, manner and just should be um, able and um, yeah, just should be able to find each other over the service registry. Um, uh, digging a bit deeper in the network participant, uh, we think that every participant will have, or all participants will have a variety of uh, solutions which are already in place. And so we see that with a like a more <clears throat> central component called the Atlas Data Service. All that we have outside there in form of clouds and solution uh, providers today should be able to um, combine 
or connect to the Atlas network through an Atlas data service. This Atlas data service in the end shall keep their sovereignty over everything that they have. And, uh, oh, this is broken up, one second. So it keeps their uh, sovereignty and, um, but that brings up the participants and the need to bring some stuff as well that we actually do not see that the Atlas network uh, will bring. So for example, something like a proprietary service from the own data services, an identity provider, consent management systems and data storage capabilities, which will still be um, placed in the participants themselves. Um, so only the connection in between them will be regulated or will be organized through an Atlas data service. Um, coming to the central component of the service registry, we see this uh, as an identifier for the participants, which can actually register a service upon a service request for the registry. Um, from quality views and for quality issues, we see that there can be later on something like a certification for the registry, which could actually come from someone uh, not connected to any economic or whatever aim. So, um, and this could be a marketplace then for everything, for everybody who wants to provide services. In the service uh, registry, the um, data services will be registered with their capabilities. There will be functions for actually registering, deregistering um, for participants, for services, for capabilities, etc. So that in the end, one provider or one consumer in the network can actually, for example, browse that registry and then there can find um, actually service providers that bring in, for example, weather data or machine data or uh, yield uh, services, etc. cetera. Um, one thing about the data service and their layers for the moment, we are thinking that the data services will be always <clears throat> built up on already existing services in all the uh, already connected platforms and systems that we have in the ACT business. So uh, every provider or every consumer lately in uh, trying to, or at least participating in the network will be in the need to like uh, introduce and implement a service layer in between the Atlas layers and his own proprietary formats. Um, we see here a service interface and a service layer mapping actually for everything that's related to um, capabilities and stuff and communication of the systems itself. And then we have these Atlas supported formats, which we are uh, at the moment very agnostic. That's our current state of, let's say, like standardization that we have. Um, we are taking like for the moment, we are trying to build a channel where you can like push everything through that is currently in the market. Um, for later or in later phases, we probably will bring a subset of formats and data types that we are actually seeing as standards, which are then to be uh, extended over time through the Atlas providers and Atlas network when it's run, actually. Um, let's come to the other complementary part of the whole network, which is um, divided into the app center and the app engine. Up here you see a picture again with an Atlas registry in the app center. Here now in these blue boxes they are separated to each other. In the end they are very much complementary to each other because the Atlas app center provides everything that the registry provides for services. The Atlas app center provides for applications. So the app lab, uh, <clears throat> This is, for example, browsing and searching for applications, installing, updating, uninstalling, etc. everything that a user actually wants. So what we want to do is, um, to give an example, for ex is um, there will be a box, for example, where we have an app engine running, and this box will be connected to the app center, and this box can then draw apps from there. And those apps then can communicate to each other. They can communicate closely, uh, to everything that has is related to hardware. So that is, in the end, the aim for all this app stuff. Um, 
I come to the next one with the app engine and the onboard computing. So why we're actually dividing this one? We see that we will have uh, a lot of use cases and a lot of scenarios where we will be in the need to have uh, computing time and uh, calculation time just in the moment where data actually is recorded or is used or needed. And that means that we have to provide something that is able to communicate either with itself or with another um, app engine or with the clouds behind it or machinery or whatever. Um, so if you, for example, take um, a livestock use case in, in, uh, in consideration where we're actually, for example, videoing animals to, uh, to analyze their behavior, we will need a lot of calculation time in the barn itself rather than having that calculation time in the uh, in the cloud for example because you will have uh, the need or you will probably have not that good connections etc so that uh, and uh, <clears throat> so it brings us in the need to have these two approaches that we have calculation time in the on the position where we actually need it um, the well, app engine to... sorry sorry you just have a minute left. Sorry, Valker. For yeah, no problem. I'm I'm done soon. Uh, the platform here provides. Uh, <clears throat> so this is the platform that actually is provided for executing applications on a machine on something that is can run it with within the app less runtime environment. So this app center or the app engine can in the end be deployed like on everything which would actually uh, host it. Um, so, and coming to the apps that we actually see in this app, chain, uh, <clears throat> app engine is, uh, we see real-time apps, job apps, platooning apps, etc. They are all for different use cases and all for different purposes. They will all communicate through that app engine with the outer world, either companion services in clouds or machines directly. And uh, probably most of them will come with a cloud-based companion service which then is registered in the registry and there we have this combination between these complementary approaches here of the app engine and app environment and of the uh, cloud-based solution and mesh network on the other hand uh, short summary atlas interoperability reference architecture the big two concepts i mentioned before data platform based and onboard computing for processing and uh, only two central components in this in this case only the registry and the app center um, and what we're doing actually we are doing two paths of the implementation we are trying to bring in early pilots now and uh, stuff like that but what we are actually assuming is that we are a bit delayed because of COVID and stuff so uh, getting into the field and getting people together is complicated at the moment so thank you and uh, eager for your questions. Thank you very much, Volker. And we're just going to keep the questions just till the end of all of the technology presentations. So we'll take the questions after um, Arne has presented, if that's okay, Volker. Okay. Um, yeah, just I'm fine. for everybody in the technology section, um, we do have a, a general question for everybody, but I'll ask that question after Arne has presented as well. Thank you very much, Volker. Um, just to let everybody know, we are running 15 minutes late on our time slot. Uh, we did have difficulties just with the password um, at the very beginning of the webinar, so we are running 15 minutes late. So we will have, um, or we hope to have a break in about 15 minutes. So our next um, presenter is Dr. Arne Ver from Sintef. He's the Chief uh, Research Scientist um, at Sintef Digital in Oslo. And since 1995, he has been involved in standardization activities and in particular on geographic data management and geospatial infrastructures and models. He's currently the leader of TF6 on technical priorities in the Big Data Value Association and is further involved in projects on data sharing with digital twins in the Horizon 2020 program. In the context of today's presentation, he is involved in the Demeter project with the responsibility for the Demeter standardization framework and has involved and has involvement in the Norwegian pilot on the farmer's dashboard, including the use of AI machine learning for prediction of milk production from cows. Arne? So uh, my topic here is on, on standardization approaches um, that we have in the, the Demeter project. And uh, <clears throat> just 
continue with all your other content. So I'll talk about uh, the emitter standardization framework, how this is uh, related to the BDVA and IoT and other reference model with a focus on generic pipelines, both on the pilot level and on the technology infrastructure level. Uh, provide a couple of examples of, of these generic pipelines um, in the IoT and, and linked data. And then uh, related to standards and, and standardization organizations that we have uh, related to so far and the next steps. Also show part of the standardization approaches of the <coughs> task forces and groups in BDVA and IoT related to, to smart farming and agriculture that we are uh, working with. So first, uh, the standardization framework. Um, standards occur in a, in a number of areas, uh, both in, in pilots or in applications, as well as in the technology infrastructure. Uh, for this, uh, we are using the BDVA reference model from the Big Data Value Association, as you see on the bottom, that talks about a number of technology areas, going from IoT sensors uh, through infrastructure with, with cloud support, data management, data processing, data analytics, data visualization, and across a number of different data types, from structured to unstructured, uh, time series, uh, spatial temporal, media, text, uh, graph data. Uh, that often is combined, uh, obviously, in applications um, based on, on ontologies and vocabularies uh, for data model interoperability. But typically brought together in an overall uh, high-level pipeline that we see generically from, from uh, say, application point of view. Uh, going on the top level here from data acquisition, data collection to data preparation, data analytics, and data visualization and user interaction. So, so this is what we call the, the top level pipeline. And uh, for most of the applications, uh, they follow these uh, steps. Uh, and of course, we'll use different components and technologies in the steps that again will be targeted for uh, standards or standardization. Orthogonal, there is other things like data sharing platforms, uh, communication uh, and security standards. So, uh, so it's a number of things that are involved uh, in, in complex applications as we have. Uh, so we view standards and standardization activities from this perspective. Uh, on the high level pipeline, uh, this can be instantiated uh, in different levels. If you look at IoT real-time data as an example, uh, we have one level, uh, a generic pipeline that deals with uh, the IoT devices, the real-time data collection and processing, typically streaming event-based, dealing with complex event processing and then the support of analytics and visualization. Uh, further, there will be concrete components uh, in these uh, steps uh, following this, uh, say, generic pipeline to be going to more uh, instance pipelines where we will start to identify interoperability points and, and access interfaces suitable for interoperability and standardization. And there are many of these uh, pipelines. Uh, here is the linked data graph uh, data pipeline for, uh, for uh, knowledge graph, linked data, uh, data collection and presentation. So we see that we follow the same four main steps. Uh, now there are heterogeneous data sources with different access methods for data management. Uh, data preparation here includes also uh, graph uh, processing and provisioning of this with data publication and linking, uh, use of data queries, support for analytics, and then uh, algorithm for decision support and visualization. Uh, the good thing is that uh, it's not one of these for each uh, application. There will be thousands. There are a, a fewer set. A lot of applications follow uh, combinations and elements of these generic pipelines. And this provides us with a suitable foundation to identify uh, interoperability points and, and interfaces where standards are relevant. So what we have been looking at then in the emitter so far is to identify relevant standard areas with their interoperability points and interfaces, both in, in pilot pipeline context, but also in the underlying technology infrastructure uh, pipelines. As we heard now from both Atlas and Demeter, there are underlying technologies for uh, dealing with, uh, with uh, service registries, with uh, data access, authentication, authorization, and so forth. 
uh, that also uh, have important uh, areas of interoperability points. So uh, we have identified a number of, of standards and standardization groups that we are relating to, typically in two ways, uh, standards that we use uh, and standards that we see uh, um, closely to the, to the agriculture domain uh, and the need for also being more involved with respect to, to impact the standards and maybe initiate new standards. These uh, areas are, are again mapped back to the reference model. So we have uh, communication, uh, internet interoperability standards with uh, well-known organizations at the IATF, the World Wide Web Consortium, uh, their underlying technologies, uh, OASIS and MQTT, there's a number of communication infrastructure standards. We also look into blockchain support with some blockchain related standards, uh, obviously using cloud computing standards and a number of security standards um, that we might uh, have also feedback on uh, if they turn out to, to not fit our needs. But there are certainly standards that are, are closely related to uh, activities in the agriculture domain. So uh, <clears throat> geospatial uh, data uh, and earth uh, observation uh, data and standards from the OGC and ISO TC211 are important standard organizations and, uh, and standards that we use. Also environmental animal welfare standards such as ISO standards for radio identification of animals and, and for irrigation monitoring. Uh, consumer food uh, retail standards uh, uh, from GS1 and IFS. Uh, obviously in our applications, uh, we have an increased now use of AI uh, machine learning uh, with the new ISO SC42 on AI and big data being prominent as a standard organization, as well as the ISO SC41 on IoT. Uh, this goes further into big data and data platforms and aspects of data sharing, but it also links to organization that we heard mentioned like IDS, the International Data Spaces and their association, the integration of data infrastructure now with the European Gaia-X initiative, and then the foundation of uh, semantic interoperability support through vocabularies and ontologies, data exchange standard, such as the, the, the agriculture information model you heard about from Demeter, how it relates to, to standards from Etsy, uh, IoT, Smart M2M, the SARF Agri standard, Inspire, related to ISO TC211, and uh, uh, agro vocabulary and uh, other things emerging uh, also into standard organizations such as ODC. So, so these we are more involved with uh, because of their uh, link to agriculture domain, but obviously also the more ICT oriented standards are, are relevant uh, to relate to because we are making much use of those. And, and uh, if any challenges uh, occur in the pilots, we of course want to have the feedback mechanism for further improvement of these standards for the future. So these are some of the concrete standards and standardization organizations that we relate to. Uh, what we are doing now is to follow up the standards use uh, experiences and impacts uh, from the pilot perspective. So looking at uh, the standards planned for use uh, in the pilot demonstrator pipelines uh, and, and uh, the impact the relevance for that. And also in the more technical work, uh, in our technical work packages, we look at the standards there for the infrastructure and how we can interact with the standardization groups that I mentioned, the IoT uh, standards group uh, and the Smart Agri group, BDVA. Um, we have an interaction already with Atlas and Demeter together in the OpenDI project, which is on, on digital platform interoperability across a number of sectors. Uh, so that includes uh, energy and smart homes, but also agriculture. We have the emerging uh, IDS uh, integration of data sharing in the GAIA-X uh, European initiative, European interoperability framework, the EU multi-stakeholder standards group, and also of course uh, links into activities in the in the DGUR and uh, open standards in ISO, SEN, SENELEC, OGC, ETSI, OMG and others. 
Related Sorry. to the European projects, uh, there is a couple of uh, uh, groups that are in particular relevant to follow up because they are supporting the uh, European projects uh, that we are linked to. <clears throat> we have the IoT, the Alliance of Internet of Things Innovation, working group three on IoT standardization, which has provided a very good foundation on uh, technical communication and IoT standards and that context which is uh, related to working group six on smart farming. So, so there is good work that has been done so far as a foundation that further can be contributed to, as well as in the BDVA, the Big Data Value Association, um, which has a technical priority group with a standardization focus and a benchmarking. So I'm the lead of this task force six on technical priorities. And then we have the application group uh, where we have a special agriculture group led by Nuria Sanchez from, uh, from Atos. So these two groups are in particular, say, related because they are supporting each other and supporting uh, European projects uh, and, and is a particular relevant uh, contact point. So that was the overview of the approaches we have. And here are some references to me and to the project. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, we just do have one question and then we will take a break and um, we'll take a slightly shorter break today. Um, we'll hope to finish um, just in the next two or three minutes and we'll just take a 10 minute break instead of a 15 minute break. So I have a question actually for all of the panelists involved in the technology uh, piece of today's webinar, which is Ayana, Thanasis, Volker and Arne. Um, they, people are just wondering if there's, if one of you could possibly highlight the differences or similarities or advantages or disadvantages of the architecture or the architecture of both projects. Would anybody like to take that question? I mean, I can, Stefan Rilling from Atlas, uh, I can take over. So what, what I would have to say is it's yet difficult to answer what, what uh, are the advantages, disadvantages, because uh, I would say to, to give a, a good answer on this, we need real implementations of both architectures and demonstrations of uh, use cases, which we can do with this, these architectural approaches. And uh, then we can, we can see what are the real advantages, disadvantages. So, I, I'm afraid that I cannot give a real, real answer on, on this, uh, except from we will have to, to wait until we see something. I'm not sure, Kevin, what, what you are thinking about, about this. Hi. Yeah, well, but one thing I can say is we, we have a workshop organized next week between Atlas and Demeter, actually, specifically to look at that type of question about how what's the complementarities and differences. Uh, and approaches between our various architectures. So um, we just have to wait for the output from that. And when will the output from that be available, Kevin, or do you know when it might be available? We don't know. I'm not, we're not actually sure, Stefan, are we, are we going to do a report on that? or, or what is it? it might just be an internal thing, but we, we could maybe doing some sort of a joint, even possibly a joint white paper on the approaches or something like yes, that. Yes, uh, I would say something like this sh should be done. And uh, let's see what, what comes out next week. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, there are differences in both architectural approaches. I, I think what, what uh, Atlas is, uh, 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 one, one thing which we have, especially in Atlas, is that, that edge computing, on-site computing considered into the architecture. So there are differences. Uh, but uh, I mean, we are far away from, from being able to judge what is, what is working, what is not working. And uh, I think a, a joint white paper or an overview about all, all the, the, the most recent architectures would be one way to give a better answer to that question. And I'm sure it's well, one, say, uh, one approach would be to use this reference model we have in the standards context and to identify common standards areas that uh, would be relevant for both of the projects, both of the approaches. Mm -hmm. So that can be part of the discussion. As I said, this, yeah. this is work to be done that we should put into you now these workshops coming up. Perfect. Yeah, and, and, and just to say, I mean, the workshops that are coming up are also taking into account existing architectures from projects like IOF 2020 and so on mm -hmm. as well. So, 
We're now uh, moving on to the multi-actor ecosystems uh, approach by both the Atlas and Demeter project. And with that in mind, I'd like to present to you or to uh, Onya and Onya Lenneman and Stefan Reeling from Fraunhofer will give their presentations. So Dr. Onya Lenneman is a biochemist and since 2011, she has worked as a project and research manager at Fraunhofer Institute of Applied Information Technology, Augustine. In the past, she's been involved in a number of national and international projects in the field of life sciences, but especially in healthcare. Responsible for, the, for establishing new research opportunities in the fields of sustainable food. Stefan, whom you would have met earlier on, um, is the project coordinator for ATLAS. And Onya and Stefan will present the multi-actor approach in both Demeter and ATLAS today. Thank you. Okay, can... thank you for the introduction. I hope you see my slides already. Yes, I can, Onya. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak the, about the multi-actor approach uh, in Demeter. And um, before I start speaking about the special multi-actor approach in Demeter, I would like to say a few words according the multi-actor approach itself. Of course, you know that Demeter and Atlas um, require to apply the multi-actor approach uh, itself. And um, the multi-actor approach projects aim at uh, closing the innovation gap between research and between practice. So uh, that means that uh, scientists and developers have to closely collaborate with farmers to create solutions that are in the end really accepted by the users. Uh, in the past, um, the EU has allocated quite a lot of money uh, to fund multi-actor approach projects. So about 1 billion euros um, have been um, um, allocated for that and more than 180 multi-actor approach, pro multi approach projects have been funded in the past. Um, there is a quite nice brochure describing the core idea of um, multi-actor approach projects. You see the one on the right hand side and there's also the link inside uh, the slide so whenever you're interested in multi-actor approach projects uh, it is quite quite a good hint to have a look into the brochure that is offered by the EIP AGRI. Um, the main aspect of multi-actor approach projects is that they have to focus on real life problems. That means that the problems um, that they are dealing with um, have to be the problems that end users like farmers and foresters are dealing with in the everyday life. And um, addressing those kind of pro problems is the best way to, to uh, apply a co-creation process. That means that from the beginning, from the definition of the problem or the challenge that has to be tackled until the end, they join uh, the forces to co-create the solutions, um, meaning that the end users, that the developers and also other stakeholders are involved in the developing process. And in the end, if the multi-actor approach is successful, you will have a solution that is accepted because the uh, uh, end users, they co-decide within the uh, development and they are co-creators and this leads to a, a, a accepted solution and a quite useful solution for the end users. In addition, multi-actor approach projects um, have to um, support these kind of activities with um, uh, things like uh, dissemination and promoting the results of the project and the process of the project that the outer world also gets to know what is happening inside the project. So it's, it's letting the people know what you are doing and also facilitating the discussions on the project and to get the, the opinions from other stakeholders um, um, so that you know the opinions on that and that you can also deal with their meanings and uh, with their their interests. Um, how do we, meaning we as Demeter, are tackling the, the multi-actor approach? Um, um, you can see here some aspects that uh, the work package 7, so we have an own work package for the multi-actor approach, um, which kind of aspects we, we are tackling within the project. Of course, the most important thing are the real-life problems and they are defined by our 20 pilots. They have already shortly described uh, by Kevin in the beginning, but um, I would like to, to um, name them again. So we have uh, 20 pilots that are distributed all over in Europe. And um, 
I don't know why, but I can't see my slides, but I can see myself right now. Um, <laughs> that makes it a bit difficult. But you see my slides fine, right? Yes, we can see it. Yes. Okay. Okay. No. Um, okay. So we have uh, the 20 pilots situated in, in Europe, in, in North, East, West and South. And um, the pilots are clustered into five thematic clusters. The first two ones are dealing with arable crops. The first one is more focusing on water and energy management. Then we have the second one focusing on agricultural machinery and precision farming. Then we have the cluster fruits and vegetables, healthy and high quality crops. Um, the fourth cluster is dealing with livestock, um, animal health, high quality and optimal management of animal products. And last but not least, we have a cluster, a cross-sectoral cluster addressing the full supply chain, interoperability and robotics. So um, these pilots define our real life problems that we are uh, addressing in, in uh, Demeter. And we will have a report on a presentation on the um, pilot 5.1. So from the fifth cluster later on, and I'm looking forward to hear what they are describing about their real life problems, their challenges, and how we want to uh, provide solutions to them. Um, Yeah, of course, we have some other aspects as well. So the next aspect is the co-creation process with all actors. And um, co-creation takes place on different levels. But on the project level, we have defined an iterative approach, including testing under real conditions. So you see here just a small uh, um, um, part of our Gantt. And um, you see that we have two pilot rounds, meaning that in these pilot rounds, the solutions that we have developed so far are applied on the pilot side, under real conditions, and in the hands of the farmers. And during this testing phase and evaluation phase, we gain feedback from them in their everyday life. And this kind of feedback, this knowledge, this experiences will be taken into account into the further development so the, the solution is, is adapted and, and um, to, um, to the, the expectations uh, from the farmers. Then it is um, tested again. And in the end, we will have a solution that really meets the farmer's needs. Um, then we have some more aspects that we want to address with our multi-actor approach. One is, for example, the knowledge exchange. Multi-actor approach project should focus on knowledge exchange. They should foster the knowledge exchange inside the consortium and as well as outside of the consortium. And um, we had one activity which was um, driven on demand uh, due to COVID-9. For example, we uh, developed a workshop on um, how you can interactively um, interact with, with, with participants, but in a remotely way. So we have gathered some experiences on that um, during our activities, and we uh, collected those kind of experiences and um, yeah, provided, on the one hand, uh, an overview of, um, for example, which kind of tools can be used, for example, performing user group, performing hackathons. And on the other hand, we also provided the uh, possibility to test one of those tools. Uh, this uh, tool is called Mural. It's, it's something like a whiteboard where you can perform brainstormings uh, or voting sessions or clustering activities. So all this uh, can be done with the, with the tool called Mural and, and we provided our participants the opportunity to test the, this tool and the aim of course was to enable the participants to perform workshops on their own. Yeah, and um, um, we, of course, have some other activities like open calls. This is something that is addressed later in the webinar session. And, of course, we are also performing targeted dissemination activities, and we are open for cross-project collaboration. So these are also aspects of the multi-actor approach. But due to the time, um, it's not uh, possible to go that much into detail, and therefore, I would like to hand over to Stefan, um, who is describing how the Atlas project is, this, um, is addressing the multi-actor approach. And 
I'm looking forward to his presentation now. Thank you. Thank you, Anja. Um, so you, I think you can see the screen now. I still see my screen. No, oh, I, I see your screen. Yes, no. Okay. That's good. Yeah. So I'm, I will shortly present a multi-actor approach uh, we are following uh, in ATLAS and uh, how we understand this in, in ATLAS. So we have already heard um, multi-actor approach is real-world problems and complementary expertise. And uh, I'm just repeating the, the slide about a consortium, uh, which actually shows uh, our complementary expertise in, in the project. So we have, we have actors and, and uh, consortium members from very, very uh, heterogeneous fields of expertise we have computer scientists, we have engineers, we have uh, hydrologists, we have uh, agronomes, we have machinery engineers, uh, we, we have uh, a lot more. So uh, I think we, we really, really fulfill this criteria of uh, complementary uh, knowledge in, in the project. And uh, we are dealing with the, with the real world problems from the farmers, from the machinery industry, which we also see as an end user of the technology we develop. Um, so I think these two criteria are very well uh, addressed by Atlas. And uh, here, here you see an, an, a more detailed overview what we are doing in, in Atlas and how this relates to that multi-actor approach. So we have already heard today um, the term from farm to fork. Um, and this reflects uh, at least a part of the agricultural value chain so we we understand the multi actor approach also to be to be uh, um to be working on multiple aspects of the agricultural value chain and i mean as as you can see in the in the image so the the the, the fork is uh, <clears throat> still a missing component uh, we are we are looking at all the the machines the sensors which will uh, then be uh, enabled to work on the on the field and uh, then after after harvest, the yield is is also in, in on, on on the farm. And um, then uh, currently we, we stop there in in Atlas. It is of course envisioned to also connect uh, the the food processing uh, uh, industry uh, to to this. But uh, currently we are we are not uh, completely ending up at uh, the fork or on the spoon, so to say. But uh, the actors we, we have here in, in, in Atlas are, of course, the, the, the farmers, they, they, they run the farm, they, they do the work there. We have machinery and, and, and sensor manufacturers, which, which are delivering tools uh, to, to support um, the farmers' uh, work. Also, the agricultural software and service providers, which, uh, which are part of, of that, that value chain, which provide tools uh, to the farmer. And, and, of course, the farmer pays for, for this. Um, and uh, yeah, we have data service providers. We have we have research, which is also a part in in, in the value chain. And uh, we have also sensor platform and ro robotics development and research in in Atlas, which also contributes to to uh, tools and and in the end contributes to a, a successful uh, harvest. Um, uh, as it has been said, real world problems are. are a main factor of that multi-actor approach. So on the following slide, I just briefly introduce you to the to the use cases we are we are working on in, in Atlas and where, where all the work in Atlas is aligned on. Uh, and these use cases are reflecting uh, very, very real problems uh, uh, farmers are today uh, facing and, and will be uh, for sure facing in, in, in the future. Um, and that's just very brief overview looking at, at the time. Um, so we have that, that multi-harvest platoon management use case, um, data recording about yield quality, um, different different machines, different harvesters, everything ends up in, in one yield quality map and uh, to be processed uh, then uh, by further analysis services. We have uh, always end users from the consortium for, for these use cases. Then uh, fertilization is also really, really a uh, major topic in Atlas. So here uh, the goal is, uh, I mean, most of the farmers have, uh, uh, have livestock. This produces slurry that uh, will be put out on the field. 
and then uh, you, you fill up uh, P, K, and, and N with, with uh, artificial fertilizers according to, to sensor measurements. Also here are, we have uh, multiple end users for this. Um, platoon management, machine tracking, online task management, uh, connection from infield sensors to machines. These are all ma machinery related use cases driven by the by the act industry. So um, uh, they are also also really a, 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 a driver for, for use cases in, in Atlas. Then livestock behavioral analysis, uh, something we are we are dealing with uh, uh, also multiple partners from Atlas. You will hear about that in, in the upcoming presentation by my colleague. So I, I won't uh, go into detail here. Uh, related to livestock farming is uh, nutrient cycle balance. Uh, farmers have to document everything they, they bring in uh, into the farm and, and they bring out uh, on the field or uh, as food. And we are trying to, to support this with a, a multitude of technology. Then target application uh, of uh, fertilizers, of plant protection using LiDAR sensing, using uh, sensor data and online processing. It's also a use case here. Um, irrigation management, very important, especially for Southern European countries, but also emerging here in Germany. Sensor-driven irrigation, uh, documentation, measurement, all these kind of things. Um, soil analysis through proprioceptive sensing, uh, one, one mean for machine control, uh, one use case driven by, by our research partners, also uh, important for robotics. So, uh, oh, yeah. Perfect. multiple use cases provide technological solution for real world problems and the consortium reflects the multi-actor approach. That's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Stefan and Anonia. Um, I'll move along now to our next presenter, who is Gronja Dillon from TSSG. Gronja is the communications, communications and dissemination coordinator for the Demeter project, and she is also a PhD researcher at TSSG here at Worship Institute of Technology in Ireland. Her current research, which is funded by the Demeter Project, is focused on understanding the farmer's decision-making process in adopting smart farming technologies. Gwony will present today some of the internal and external factors which impact the adoption of technology in an agri context. Gwony? Great. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. As Hazel mentioned, I will look at technology adoption in an agri context. And specifically speaking, I'm going to look at the factors which impact the adoption of smart technology. Um, so why are we researching this? When you look at the adoption levels in the EU compared to other nationalities, we're definitely lagging behind, although there is a difference in between the various countries within the EU. So there's a real need to understand what's impacting the farmer's decision-making process and which factors hinder and influence them. So um, several researchers have looked at this area and they've grouped the categories affecting adoption into five um, different categories. So I'm going to look at these in more detail. So we have the informational, the behavioral and social, the business and economic, the technological, and the external influences. Now, there are other factors, of course, influencing adoption, but uh, in the time constraints that we have, these, is what, these are what I'll focus on today. So moving to the informational factors. So um, adoption of a technology can only take place once diffusion occurs, so once the information seeps through to the relevant target audience. But if there's ineffective communication, this leads to lower levels of awareness, which leads to lower levels of adoption. So farmers cite that they perceive that they have a lack of awareness of, of these technologies, and they think there's a major disconnect or a gap in the knowledge transfer from experts, academics, scientists, right down to them. For those that are aware of the technologies, they believe that there's an information overload. So if a farmer goes to look about, to learn more about technology, they're seeing multiple different technologies available from sensors to robotics to drones. So they're unsure as to which is the most relevant to them. Then they're unclear of the benefits. So they might read a case study relating to a farm in another part of the world, a bigger or smaller farm or a different type of farm. So they now think that smart technologies aren't relevant to them. And then really importantly, they cite that they're not clear on the return on investment. So that's a major point for them. They need more information on that. And then also they believe that the information that they're receiving 
there is more um, technical language being used which alienates them somewhat. In terms of where the farm is getting their information, they're getting it from a variety of different sources. So it's really important that when we're diffusing the information to the farmer that we're using a, a multitude of sources. So early tech adopters, they're more proactive in their approach and they're actively seeking information. So they're talking to their farm advisor, but they're also using mass media to learn more. The more mainstream farmers, they tend to get their information from their peers and also um, maybe a family relationship as well. The farm advisor is one person that, that has been recognized as giving impartial advice. So early tech adopters and mainstream farmers, they trust this sort of information above all. Uh, membership of a farming group is also really positive as they can share information among themselves and also attending events that the government sponsors but that farmers are involved in can really help the farmer learn more about smart technology. Next, we move to the behavioral and social factors. So an age is an interesting one. So some studies say that there is no correlation between age and adoption, while others say that younger farmers are more, are more likely to adopt the technology. So this would suggest that although age is important, it's not the most influential factor in determining adoption. Education, however, is important. So the more educated the farmer is, the more likely they are to adopt smart technologies. Culture is also quite an interesting one. So what is the culture of where the farmer is based? and what affinity do they have with traditional farming practices so that will impact adoption. Location also is important because that will look at you know, the climate of where the farm is based, will that be suitable for the technology adoption, but also what you'll see is clusters of farms in a region adopting technology, and that's really to do with diffusion of information between those farmers in that region. But perhaps more interesting is the role of perceptions and attitudes. So this really impacts the adoption of technology. So adoption is very much associated with what the farmer believes the, in, the impact will be. And that might be in terms of economic profitability, but also uh, reduced environmental impact or time saving, et cetera. So this attitude, particularly towards technology, is formed by two variables. The first one is the perceived usefulness of that technology. And the second one is the perceived ease of use. So if the farmer believes that they have the capacity or the tech, the know-with-all to use the technology, and if they believe that it will help them do their job in a better way, they're more likely to develop a positive attitude. Whereas if they have any distrust of technology, if they have fear about using it, they're more likely to develop a negative attitude. So this attitude really impacts on the behavior they tend to use, which impacts the end adoption. So we really need to make sure that the farmer has a positive attitude toward these technologies. We also look at the role of the farmer's personality, so how open they are, how connected they are to society, and also what's their um, attitude to risk. So a risk-averse farmer is less likely to be interested in using technology. It should be noted, though, that farmers, um, they say that their expectation of what the technology would deliver for them is significantly lower than what the tech providers or um, scientists believe. Next, we move to business and economic. So one of the major factors that farmers cite as hindering their adoption is the, the cost of what the smart technologies are. Um, and it's not only the initial investment in terms of the hardware and software, but it's also the time it takes to upskill or to learn or ha what to use with the data that these technologies provide. So that's it's a major hindrance. Um, and unsurprisingly, larger farmers are, uh, are more likely to adopt these technologies because they can absorb some of the financial risk associated with um, implementation. So with that in mind, many smart farming solutions have been designed with that larger farmer in mind. And again, this alienates some of those smaller farmers. But it should be noted because there's so many different types of farm sizes uh, and different types of farming contexts, there isn't a one size uh, fits all solution. And what we see is arable farmers or farmers involved in horticulture or viticulture, their adoption levels are slightly higher than animal-based farming. So um, there's definitely a difference there. We move to technological factors, which I won't talk about too much because I know Peter, who is after me, is going to discuss these. But the one thing we need to look at are the characteristics of the technology, because these help um, impact the user perception. So the first thing is, how easy is the technology to use? It is, is it intuitive or is it difficult for the farmer once they have it? Um, so the more intuitive it is, the easier it will be to adopt. The next is how compatible the, far, the technology is with the farmer's uh, values and experience. 
So if it matches, again, it's going to be easier for the farmer to adopt. Trialability is very important. So if the farmer feels that they can adopt the technology, uh, trial it before full adoption, this will help increase the, their adoption level because it reduces some of the risk that they see associated with full implementation. And then the next thing is relative advantage. So does the technology improve the way the farmer is currently doing things? If the farmer believes it so, they will adopt, no problem. And then finally, observability is more important for those mainstream or later adopters. So if they can physically see themselves that the farmer who has adopted the technology is reaping the benefits, they'll be more likely to adopt as well. Uh, just briefly to talk about in terms of technology factors, we have to look at the role of connectivity, interoperability and data privacy concerns because these all can create a negative, neg negative attitude towards adoption which will create a neg negative behavioural intent. So if these issues aren't solved, it can lead to distrust and scepticism um, and that can be hard to overturn. And then the final area we look at is external influences. So who are the value, the stakeholders in the value chain and how do they impact the farmer and their decision making process? So of all these in front of us here, the regulator is the most influential. So farmer sites, the tax subsidies or incentives will be the most beneficial in, in terms of encouraging them to adopt technology. But we are seeing a real trend moving towards uh, sustainable um, consumption. So customers are looking for products that have been farmed sustainably, etc. So the retailer, the processor and distributor, they're now looking to create these kind of products, which could put some further pressure on the farmer to um, use these technologies. Although it should be noted that if the farmer feels that they're forced into using these technologies, they have a major distrust of the technology. So in conclusion, how do we overturn some of these factors and encourage adoption among the farming community? Well, we need to create more case studies um, that are relevant to the farmer. So in terms of their location, their type of farm, their size of farm, there needs to be more training, education and workshops for these farmers, particularly government sponsored events, because they feel that that advice is impartial um, but that farmers are involved in them. So it very much goes back to that multi-actor approach. Um, the farm advisor has a big role to play because again, we know that they're trusted. So if information can be diffused through them effectively, it can help to increase the awareness levels, which can help the adoption levels. Um, there was a question earlier about small farmers getting access to capital for these technologies. And that is an area that you know could be looked at. There might be some area for um, shared initiatives between farmers within a location. Um, the government are continuing to invest in this technology and that must increase. So even though the farmer may have all the intent to use the technology, if the infrastructure um, lets them down, it, it's no good. So we need continued investment in those areas. Uh, for those who have data privacy concerns, there need to be contracts and agreements so that they feel that they, um, that they know exactly what's happening with their data and it's trustworthy. And then if there is an opportunity to incentivize the farmer to use the technologies, um, again, it would make sense for them. So um, that's it from me. Thanks, we'll take questions at the end. Great, Gronia, thank you very much. Actually, I do have a question for you straight away. Brilliant presentation. Um, we, a question that just, has just come in for you. Um, you've given some really good insights into the factors um, influencing farmers' adoption of technology. How is Demeter helping? Well, I'm doing my PhD on this at the moment. So um, what I'm looking at is the farmer's decision-making process when adopting technology. And within Demeter, there are 6,000 farmers taking part. So I will be, and some of them are tech savvy, some are not tech savvy. So there's a real mix and they're from all the different European countries. So I will be, um, doing a questionnaire to these um, farmers and also some interviews with them as well to really understand their decision-making process, what are the, the pain points. And again, because as we heard earlier, there's a lot of them involved in these pilot projects, we can learn more about how they feel the technology is working for them, anything that they would change in terms of the design, anything they would change in terms of data privacy as well. So I suppose we're down at the ground level talking to the farmers who are using the technology learning about their experiences and then as part of my PhD I'll be talking to a wider network understanding the subject in more detail. Yeah Hazel I can also jump in on that as well just to note again you know we've got multiple pilots running across all the way across Europe in, in 
a, a large amount of different farms and there we'll be able to actually show and demonstrate the, the capabilities of our technology. So it, it dovetails in very closely with what Grania is looking at within the project. Brilliant. That's great. Thank you very much. A really interesting uh, PhD, Grania. I'm sure people are very envious across Europe uh, as to what you're doing at the moment. Well done. So next, uh, Peter Frolic from Agri Circle. Uh, Peter uh, Frolic is um, a farmer and agronomist and worked for a leading agri um, business company for more than seven years. In 2012, Peter incorporated Agri Circle together with Daniel Marquardt and Sense is working there in precision farming with a focus on remote sensing and digital agronomy. Peter will present technology adoption from a farmer's perspective today, focusing on interoperability and data protection and privacy. Peter? So, welcome to everyone from my side. Um, I'd like to present the farmer's perspective. It's more a hands-on perspective of farmers, how we have observed it in the market. Uh, so let me just go through it quickly. Farmers today, they have a lot of things to manage and this is uh, sometimes overseen. So they work on different things um, just for a short time or maybe just for a short time in a year and then not for a year again. So they really need to have make things easy for them to, to use and also to reuse. When we look at digitalization, it just makes it much more um, difficult for them to manage old things if you think of what has all to be connected to to work together and it's getting more complex with uh, IOT coming in drones satellites and and most likely more to come we have some um, I would say innovative farms that show the challenges that we face so we have for example one farm having 15 sites um how he how will he manage in the in the future the different barns their their fields their potatoes or so, so specialty crops so there's a lot to be managed which is not what we have seen in the past on farms like uh, having one site and then being managed by a family so it, it's more and much more complex operations now these farms that we see they use a lot of tools so this is just one case we have seven tools here to be managed on, on one farm and, and those seven tools they actually need to talk to each other somehow or need to be brought together by the farmer and that's kind of a lot of work for them to to stay on top of things and of everything and of every tool so um, think about the interfaces maybe changing slightly uh, buttons changing whatever so um, for them is a lot of work to, to stay up on things also in digitalization so that they can use the tools they really want to use now this reminds me what happened in agriculture in other areas so uh, thinking of uh, machinery mechanics so we have the three pot uh, lifter um, where we have some standardization and um, when we talk standardization you have several possibilities you can force everyone to use yours you can kind of rework everything to do it or you can try to create an open standard and that's obviously what we're trying to do and that's also what the three point lifter or the hitch or however whatever you have is there and, and you already heard it there are different versions of such open source tools in different countries but um, looking at mechanics and I think that's also going to happen in the web at a certain place and uh, I think that's why it's also good to have different initiatives um, now how is stuff looking at the web and uh, we know this different tools talking to each other and I think that's what we also have to um, get done in the agricultural world that the things are talking to each other through APIs and uh, yeah that's also what farmers are expecting from us. So not the seven tools to be in one, but the seven tools to actually work together. There are different technologies to do that, to actually have APIs to follow up on them, to, to, to have the versioning and everything done. So that's also what we try to use. And things need to become much easier to handle. I mean, I just put here an example. Um, how it's done today you actually play your file onto the terminal then the next step you have to import it 
then it's kind of reworked that it works on the terminal. And there's uh, more steps to come so that you can start the task. And I'm uh, using the technology myself. I'll probably I have to click about uh, five or six buttons till I can start. Um, and uh, yeah, many times you just forget one. So what we look for is to simplify this. You can start, you drive to the field, push a big green button, uh, spray boom unfolds, uh, path, driving path is loaded, is activated, um, quantities are on, you just start, you just drive. Uh, and, and that's what we want to enable and that's why we also came to this more app engine and app approach like um, architecture and also products that we want to see in the future so that farmers get things easy and, and manageable so that you can put a driver on a tractor that uh, oversees activities but that doesn't need to be schooled for a week until he fully gets the understanding on how to use things uh, this is the network that we want to build because of that so we have the cloud aspects we have the service registry in the center and then also the app engine on the machines that shall enable those things and, and make things easier um, this shall prepare for new uh, solutions. Uh, there's one here on the left side which shows you uh, more where you have regional issues. So we have these disease forecast tools. Uh, we bring in new aspects there with uh, remote sensing. So again, new data comes in. And then based on this, we could start spraying. And we, and this you see to the right, we even have applications look we look at where you have drones flying that actually see not only diseases but infections and uh, as you know also with humans you can react much better to things when you act when you even don't feel it uh, at the moment so for example you get sick you put a lot of vitamin c you might not get sick at all so that we actually can go into such uh, technologies and enable them make them easy and um, this is just with today's uh, state of art it's not doable and that's what we want the atlas architecture to be ready for because these are actually innovations that companies are working on together with farmers and um, yeah i think that's kind of the future we're looking at um, another um, real case i would say is this one here it's um what eth and other members have been looking into in a big european uh, project uh, called flourish it has been finished some months ago so we have robots in a field that work with uavs and actually look for places to act and a architecture for interoperability should also be ready for this so that you can have a robot in a field it can be a tractor that is driving you have a drone flying next to it, capturing data, guiding the ground vehicle. So things to become easy, even if it's a completely new and latest technologies, that's, that's what we should look for to make farmers' jobs easier. And then last but not least, this has to go up to the food value chain. And this is what a lot of people forget Farmers don't usually. I mean, finally, someone needs to pay the price. And in most cases, it ends up on the consumer's plate. So um, somehow we have to generate more value in the consumer markets or in the at, from consumers. And this we can reach through uh, looking better for the environment, doing waste limitations, increasing food quality, and also the whole traceability. So to bring closer consumers and the agbis and for this also a lot has to be much easier and more interoperable so that we can actually have a higher return in agriculture and i think digitalization can help a lot to to actually do this and that's also why in atlas we look into uh, working with nestle and other big food producers to actually also get closer to consumers that's it. Thanks a lot from my side. Great, Peter. Thank you very, very much for that. Really informative. 
So now we're just going to move on to the pilot activities uh, with the meter and stuff we have from Mark Hoffman from Fraunhofer. And he's been employed in Fraunhofer as a research associate since September 2015. He's graduated at the University of Alabama with a master's degree, having focused on machine learning, artificial intelligence, and computer vision. Mark's talk will focus today on a livestock monitoring system that is being developed within the scope of Atlas with the intended goals Thank you for the introduction. Uh, can everyone see my screen? I can hear you and we can see your screen, but not in presenter's mode. Yes, okay. Great, perfect. Okay, um, yes, I'm going to talk uh, about the uh, behavioral analysis and monitoring of livestock. Um, now, for the goals and motivation um, behind livestock monitoring is of course to ease the workload for the farmers because they have um, nowadays they have a very large number of animals some farmers and um, they need to supervise them personally and uh, so it would be uh, desirable to automate this process and of course to increase the animal welfare so the main points are detection of diseases and um, detecting potentially harmful behavior. So we have, um, we already uh, went to several of our pilot sites um, in last year and we discussed the requirements for our use cases with the farmers. So the requirement for the monitoring systems are first scalability because as I said, uh, the farms can have a very large number of livestock and a large number of barns and pens or boxes in these barns. Um, the system needs to be affordable, so the cost uh, per barn, uh, per pen, and of course also per animal should be kept low, um, so that the farmer can expect to uh, return a profit. And there's also environmental conditions such as high humidity and temperature in the barns, um, but of course also uh, darkness, and different lighting conditions that the sensors have to uh, record for. And one point that was very important to the farmers was also privacy. So um, in the case of uh, video surveillance, uh, they want the ability to switch off the recording at any time. And according to these requirements, um, we chose the following hardware setup for our first pilot. And um, so we are going to use uh, IP infrared cameras. Uh, this can also see in the dark. Um, we try to keep the price between 50 and 100 euros for our first demonstrator. They are going to be powered over Ethernet. This makes it easier uh, to connect the, the cameras. And they have IP66 environmental protection against uh, humidity and temperature. Um, we're also going to install a processing unit uh, on the site. This is going to be based on the Raspberry Pi, connected to a hard drive uh, for storing videos locally because the internet is not very, um, um, because they do not have a very high bandwidth. Um, we are going to store videos locally temporarily uh, and then uh, push them over the internet um, uh, at certain times only. Um, and yes, as I said, um, since the farmers wanted a way to stop the recording, we are going to include a physical on-off switch for the recording. Yes, and as I said, they are connected over the sensors are connected uh, over Ethernet to the processing unit, and the processing unit is connected to the internet. As for the software on the processing unit, um, there is a video recording uh, app which we call a companion app to our data storage service. And uh, this will regularly upload the video data based on the schedule. Um, the video data storage service is a remote file server located at Fraunhofer EIS. And um, it will give access to other services based on subscription and also notify them once new videos are available. 
Then we're going to have a second service, which is the processing service. This will fetch the videos um, from the storage service as they arrive. And it will analyze them and send the results uh, back to the user somehow. For example, this could be to an agricultural software or uh, for our first demonstrator, we are going to uh, implement some kind of web-based dashboard so the farmers can uh, have the data visualized. This is an overview of the whole system. You can see the setup uh, we're going to do on the farm with the cameras connected to the um, to the Raspberry Pi. Um, this is going to be our first uh, use case where we uh, use the service uh, and interoperability architecture. So the Raspberry Pi is going to run the Atlas App Engine and it's going to be paired with the video data storage service via the service registry and um, also the storage service and the remote processing service are also going to communicate via our API. Yes, and for the behavioral analysis itself, this is something we have, have not uh, started, um, but we have looked at the, um, at the existing uh, solutions and uh, this is basically the motivation behind this. So we want to measure the activity of the animals. How active are they? Um, how active are they in different areas of the barn? Because the cameras are fixed, uh, you can uh, even see um, when they might be feeding based on their position in the barn. And of course, how does the food and climate in the barn uh, influence the activity of the animals? And then what we want to uh, eventually do is of course, anomaly detection um, which means learning the normal animal behavior or activity and then detecting deviations from that to potentially detect uh, sick animals or uh, aggressive behavior. As for the implementation, um, for the first uh, demonstrator, we're going to have a simple activity measure based on the dense optical flow. This basically measures the amount of movement and the direction of movements uh, across the whole video. Then uh, once we have collected uh, enough data from the pilot sites, we will also uh, try to train our own convolutional neural networks for object detection and tracking. This is so we can detect the single animals, which is important for precisely um, detecting their locations, and also having a more um, granular measure of activity uh, per animal. And what I describe here is subject to research. Um, are advanced uh, topics that may might be out of the scope of, uh, of the other project, but are definitely worth a look at. That is one for first the identification of individual animals. So this would include some kind of face detection uh, for animals to identify uh, an animal during its in, uh, entire lifespan. This of course would be very useful. Um, and uh, this could be combined with something that the farmers told us that would be very useful to them, which is weight estimation of the animals just based on the video data. And this in, uh, combination uh, would mean that the farmers don't have to weight uh, the animals and can better um, can better accept the, their daily growth. These are some some of the results that uh, Stefan has already shown in his uh, slides. So we used uh, what was already available on the internet, uh, some uh, convolutional neural network that was pre-trained on the so-called open images data set, which includes uh, also pics, for example. These are photos we took uh, from during our visits on the pilot sites. And these are the results of applying the neural network. And as you can see, it can detect pics. Um, it's better at detecting the adult pics than, uh, than the young pics. Um, and there's still some pics that are not uh, detected or some false detections. So we think that um, collecting data and training our own neural network is the way to go 
we improve this. Just one minute left, Mark. Thank you. Yes, uh, I'm already finished. Great, thank you very, very much. Uh, on time and ahead of schedule. Thank you very much, Mark. And next, we'll move on to uh, Senka Javolf um, from DNet and Tom Popovic. Um, Senka holds a position of product manager for agriculture and is responsible for the development of AgroNet suite of solutions, maintaining a relationship with relevant stakeholders and clients. And Tom holds the position of assistant professor at the University of Donja Garike. I think I pronounced that okay. And teaches computer science and information systems design courses. Uh, Senka and Tama will talk today about pilot project focusing on monitoring on farm and post farm activities in vineyards and orchards and poultry farms, thus providing data to enable a transparent supply chain. Senka and Tama, I can yes. see your presentation. Very well. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you as well, Tama. Excellent. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, it is an honor to participate in this uh, Horizon 2020 uh, AgriTech Research in uh, Europe webinar uh, hosted by Demeter and Atlas Projects. Uh, in this session, continuing with the discussion about multi-actor uh, ecosystems, we continue talking about piloting activities, and uh, our presentation is called Transparent Farm to Fork uh, Supply Chain. Uh, the presentation is prepared by partners on Demeter project uh, and uh, Ms. Senka and, and I will be presenting. Uh, the concept of supply chain transparency was unknown 15 years ago. Uh, as we know today, consumers uh, worry about quality, safety, ethics, uh, environmental impact uh, in, food production, in food production. Uh, they want to know where the food is coming from, uh, how it was grown, if animal welfare was respected, uh, how food was transported and, and other, other issues. Um, to be able uh, to provide uh, this information, it is necessary to monitor not only the production on the farm, but actually to also uh, have information about what happens before and uh, after farming uh, activities. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, on this uh, slide, we can see the context of these uh, pilots that we are uh, talking about. And under Demeter projects, uh, we are running uh, uh, two types of uh, pilots. Uh, one of these uh, types is focused on what is actually happening on the farm, while the other one is looking more into the supply chain and its transparency. Uh, the pilots, uh, there will be multiple pilots and they will be organized in uh, four countries, uh, namely Serbia, Montenegro, Slovenia and Georgia. And they will be implemented in vineyards, orchards uh, with more than uh, 2,500 hectares and on poultry farms with yearly production over 1 million uh, chickens. Uh, on the next slide, uh, I'll uh, ask, uh, next slide please. Actually, I can't see our slides anymore. Oh, here it is. Okay. So uh, the, this slide is uh, showing the, the approach to, to uh, trustable food production supply chain. Basically, we are collecting the data related to on-farm activities from the fields and farms, such as uh, pesticide, uh, pesticide usage, uh, fertilization, animal well-being, uh, medical treatments that may take place, uh, various environmental parameters, but also we are collecting uh, data about post-farm activities, uh, thus being able to provide uh, relevant data to consumers. Uh, to implement these pilots, uh, we are using AgroNet, uh, PoultryNet, and Product Password platforms uh, provided by DunavNet. And then uh, these platforms are being integrated and interfaced with the blockchain platform provided by uh, Origin Trail. Uh, a company who is uh, also a partner on this uh, on this uh, project in order to provide digital support for transparent uh, farm to fork supply chain uh, next slide uh, basically we we have started the implementation of these uh, pilots and I'll kindly ask uh, Ms. Senka Gainov to take over the presentation and tell you a little bit more about that thank you Tomo hello from my side so, uh, we installed a range of IoT devices in vineyards and orchards to collect relevant parameters like uh, temperature, air humidity, rainfall, leaf wetness, solar radiation, and so on, and use uh, these measurements as inputs in prediction models for pests and disease appearing, thus providing uh, advices and support to the farmers in pest and disease management. Uh, 
Uh, we also did the integration with the Fed platform and Fed sprayer uh, to do to provide actually automation in pesticide application. Uh, from uh, for the poultry pilot, uh, we installed the different uh, IoT devices to collect environmental data, then operational data like feed and water consumption, uh, chicken weight, uh, and uh, actually maybe the most uh, interesting part of uh, this pilot is uh, collecting audio and video recordings of the chickens and uh, use uh, this to build animal behavior models and detect deviation from the normal behavior, leading uh, to detection of diseases, uh, some stress issues, uh, reduced mortality, and so on. Uh, AgroNet platform that is developed by Dunavnet is used as uh, the main decision support system across all deployments in vineyards and orchards, providing uh, data visualization and providing easy to use instructions to the partners. Uh, similar is uh, with the uh, poultry pilot, uh, where we use uh, uh, poultry that platform as uh, the main decision support uh, system and uh, provide the complete insight into the poultry bar. The collected information, all collected information, is used to improve the overall efficiency of the farm and uh, farm operation and on the operations in vineyards and orchards, and uh, together evidence for the establishment uh, of the transpa transparent uh, supply chain. Uh, what should be done in the future? Uh, it is the platform's integrations and uh, actually collecting information from different uh, farm management platforms about supply chain activities. Then uh, we will use uh, feedback uh, to improve and validate the functionalities, especially those uh, that are uh, AI-based, uh, like prediction and decision support. And uh, we will be focusing on creation of tools and modules uh, to enable transparent supply chain. To be able to do all this, we have a nice ecosystem of partners. Uh, we have experts in different domains, domains from uh, researchers to solution providers, uh, service integrators and uh, service providers. We have uh, big, yeah, one large agriculture companies and uh, farmers association where pilots are deployed. And uh, this ecosystem actually will help us in achieving uh, the goals uh, of the pilot. So, thanks for your attention. Great, thank you very much, Senka. And I don't think we have any questions at the moment. Um, so our next presenter now is uh, Corel Sharvat from Les Project. Uh, Corel graduated in theoretical cybernetics and he is a member of the International Society for Precision Agriculture the Research Data Alliance, and he was the president of the European Federation for Information Technology and Agricultural Food and Environment. He was the organizer of many hackathons, and the most important being Inspire Hacks 1 and 2 and Med Hackathon. Carl today will discuss the multi actor approach for the Czech farm cluster within Demeter. Carl? Thank you very much. Thank you for giving me the chance uh, to my presentation. As you know, LES project is uh, part of uh, Demeter project, but uh, although we have uh, here uh, other organization, Wireless Info, who is now involved also in smart uh, agri hubs and other activities. And uh, I would like to speak uh, a little more about now some movement in um, uh, Czech Republic, because uh, in last uh, months we succeed to start to uh, to put together uh, the group of organization which will be possible to involve in Demeter and also other uh, activities and uh, um, we are now building some uh, type of innovation hub uh, for all Czech agriculture and uh, there are a number of uh, topics of uh, interest. Uh, first is autonomous driving. Uh, uh, it is also related with many aspects what was discussed today like uh, standardization protocols and other robotics. Uh, other hot topic now is in our country climate and uh, water management as observation and precision farming or precision agriculture generally. 
So he, here you can see uh, the structure of our cluster. On one side, uh, there, there is uh, strong participation of uh, uh, farming sector. Uh, probably you know that uh, in um, the Czech Republic, uh, we have a huge number of uh, uh, big farms and uh, in uh, such uh, there is a situation that 80% uh, uh, of uh, land in the Czech Republic is in farms bigger than uh, 500 hectares. So this gives uh, the good chance for implementing different precision agriculture methods. Uh, on the, this side is uh, the uh, Czech uh, Farmer Association and there are some uh, um, advanced farm who are participating, for example, uh, the roasting the farm where we are providing a number of experiments. It is 10,000 hectares farm with uh, 32 machine with uh, autonomous driving. Uh, they use uh, contour farming and other so This is a very advanced farm. On the second side, there is now cooperation of number of uh, the uh, Czech. Uh, research or uh, crop research organization. Uh, it is um, uh, Crop Research Institute, um, Prague uh, or Czech uh, Agriculture University, uh, Research in Institute of um, Agriculture Machinery, Mendel University, uh, uh, Research uh, Institute for ir Irrigation. So all these uh, organizations are now working uh, together. And in the center, uh, we are now as uh, Les Project and Wireless Info uh, providing uh, infrastructure and uh, tools for all these organizations to be, for example, possible for um, agricultural research provided uh, ICT experiment with artificial intelligence with, uh, with the tools and to offer this to the farmers. So Wireless Info and Les Project, we are now in the middle and this gives us the good chance to validate number of uh, the technologies from uh, the project. Uh, other cooperation is more on the uh, side of the technology. It is uh, Electrotechnical Faculty who is now introducing uh, the 5G technology and also start cooperating with us uh, commercial companies, Agalido, who is supplying a uh, number of the technology, including some uh, robotics technology. So this is now structure of this uh, Czech cluster, which is uh, 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 which is around our um, innovation hub activities and uh, the goal is to uh, introduce uh, more autonomous driving to improve situation on the farm to increase adoption of the uh, new technology on the farm because uh, uh, what we recognize that many of big farms has already now uh, the new technology from John Deere from class with um, uh, tools for precision farming, but uh, they are not able to use them and they need uh, uh, to have services or organization who will help them. And this is now the way how we starting to work. You can see a number of um, uh, projects around. Uh, there are some uh, some projects uh, which already finished. Uh, uh, it is uh, uh, a foodie project uh, today was mentioned by Arne, uh, the foodie data model which was introduced in this, in this project and later uh, expanded in the data bio, but there are also uh, uh, running projects like uh, Demeter, which is uh, in the center, uh, Smart AgriHubs, I think that this project uh, was today also mentioned and uh, other project is finance from Excel, it is uh, Afar Cloud and the goal is to be able to uh, transfer this uh, technological uh, achievements from this project to on one side research community to be possible to provide more effective their research and on other side uh, to transfer this result directly to uh, farmers. Uh, uh, I am now back. Uh, it was today discussed this uh, what we are dealing a lot, and it is also now part of Demeter project. It is this uh, fully data model. This data model was developed in uh, two uh, types of data model. One is in a relational database. Now more and more is used and developed by. Uh, Poznan Supercomputing Center, uh, this RDF uh, model, and the goal is to use this model as some integration model for sharing um, information and data uh, coming from different type of activities like uh, machinery management zone, sensors measurement, uh, pesticides. 
uh, this uh, fully data model, there are four uh, parts. Mainly is used this core data model, which is uh, focus on, on the farming, but we have also uh, transport data model, sensors data model, and VGI data model. Uh, uh, here is some basic uh, technology which is based on um, um, recommendation and which is now also included as part of uh, uh, Demeter activity. So this uh, technology will be in the center of uh, uh, this uh, innovation hub and will be used and shared with uh, the both with the farmers and researchers. Here you can see uh, also the part uh, focus on uh, some cloud computing, uh, which is mainly based on Jupyter Hub, and there is uh, use number of um, uh, different analytical technology which could be used for development of new application. So this is uh, shortly about um, our activity. We believe that Demeter will help us to um, improve the solution to. Uh, integrate other things and what I look also uh, in last days on Atlas project uh, we see now for our community as very interesting the tools from Atlas uh, focus on the interoperability of uh, machinery data because this is still now for us a huge problem. So I would like thank you for your attention and if there is any question I am happy uh, to answer. So our first presentation is uh, this afternoon is from um, Mariana Fraldi, and uh, she's going to look at driving collaboration um, with open DEI activities. Mariana is the senior research in um, Tel Telnaco Menti with almost 20 years of experience in the agri-food sector. And she is currently a partner in the Open DEI project, a CSA with the aim to coordinate and support LSPs in four chosen domains, including agri-food. Today she is here um, in her role as ambassador of the agri-food domain and will present opportunities of collaboration both in the strict agri-food domain and in a wider cross-domain environment for finding opportunities, sharing knowledge, matching experiences and learning from others. Mariana? Okay, thank you. Can you see my screen? I can see your screen and I can hear you. Um, your presentation okay, just needs to Thank you. So good afternoon. My name is Mariana Faraldi from Tecno Alimenti and I am here today as a representative and ambassador of OpenDI project. OpenDI is a Horizon 2020 project. OpenDI is a Horizon 2020 coordination and support action financed under the call of the TICT 13 2019, started one year ago, and which will last three years. Uh, the consortium is composed by nine beneficiaries under the project coordination of IDC. In terms of uh, uh, the other partners, we have uh, some associations as International Data Spaces, Firework Foundation, Innovali Association. We have also uh, an organ uh, organization, Hetel, uh, multi stakeholder. We have two um, large integrators as Atos and Engineering. We have uh, uh, VET uh, Haaren University and Technalimenti, which is a non profit organization. Uh, uh, constituted under the form of a uh, uh, private-public uh, consortium of TRT food-related companies. Uh, so, um, so here you can see uh, that uh, uh, OpenDI is uh, uh, focused on four main domains. Uh, one is uh, agri-food uh, with uh, in relation to the projects financed under the code DTICT 08 and 09, energy in relation to the code DTICT 10 and 11, then we have manufacturing in relation to the call DTICT7 uh, and the health and care sector in relation to the call uh, DTICT12. Uh, Next. So uh, the keyword for sure, which better represents uh, OpenDI, is the keyword uh, cross-domain uh, coordination and support action. Next. So uh, entering in detail on the OpenDI full ecosystem, I just uh, uh, not I don't want to enter in detail into the single projects included, but just to give you the perception of the critical mass, which is beyond uh, our uh, uh, CSA. I mean, uh, more than uh, 27 innovation actions and the CSAs. 
Um, next one. Focusing on agri-food ecosystem, which is the focus of the webinar of today, you can see in these pictures um, two main circles. An inner circle, which is represented by the Meta and Atlas, which are the two innovation actions, uh, large-scale projects, uh, with whom uh, we are uh, in more relationship. And then we decided to open the ecosystem also to other more mature projects. Uh, for example, IOF 2020, which is a very, a very successful large-scale uh, pilot as well, and the Smart agri Apps and the Agirobo Food. Next. Uh, the proposed mechanism of collaboration, uh, I uh, will present it uh, divided into um, two different um, points. Uh, a collaboration into the domain, in our case into the agri-food domain, and a, a collaboration cross-domain. Next one. So, uh, for collaborating into the domain, uh, fundamentally is the setting up an uh, animation of working groups, intending with uh, this term of working group, a stable group of people, experience, in common issues which discuss among them along regular meetings for making emerge opportunities. So uh, people who sit on the same table who um, through brainstorming or uh, a discussion guided, uh, um, moderated by OpenDI uh, can make uh, emerge ideas, needs, requirements, uh, lessons learned, uh, opportunities. Uh, you have to consider in some way OpenDI as a support in practical terms uh, for managing such uh, inter-projects meetings and material. So OpenDI can act as rapporteur, as owner, co-owner of uh, repositories, uh, mailing list. So a concrete support uh, to uh, such ecosystem projects. But uh, uh, as I already said uh, with the previous keyword, uh, the benefit uh, provided by OpenDI can be for sure the possibility to match agri-food interests and needs uh, emerging in this domain with those of the other domains and identify enlarged opportunities, which can be concretized at the end in, uh, for example, uh, papers, uh, strategies, which can be shared with the European Commission. Next. Uh, speaking about working groups, uh, starting from a questionnaire circulated to the above mentioned projects uh, uh, one year ago, uh, we identified this one as uh, the most interested for all the parties. So, a table with all the coordinators, a table uh, uh, on interoperability and standardization, another one on pilots and use cases, another one on dissemination and open calls. Next one. But uh, I would like uh, uh, to stress the concept that from collaboration into the domain, so starting from these uh, working groups, uh, we can move to collaboration cross-domain. And here I would like to introduce the concept of task force. Next. So we identified uh, four uh, potential task forces, one on data sharing spaces, business ecosystem, digital platforms and pilots, performance indicators, each one guided by an experienced partner of OpenDI. It means in some way to open a debate and collaborative work environment among the cross domains uh, innovation actions where OpenDI could validate its original knowledge assets, I mean platform, pilots, ecosystem standards, in close cooperation with the representatives of the four domains. Next one. So, uh, entering in more detail, um, our proposal is that uh, to have a common six months cyclic time uh, plan for each task force. Starting from the working groups uh, um, before mentioned, the idea is to identify uh, one person uh, who can be an expert in the, in, on the topic to put on the same table with the experts of the other uh, domains to discuss uh, inside this leading community about uh, specific task force uh, uh, points. It means uh, to start with a kickoff meeting, to uh, set up the objectives and the plan for the uh, following six months, to have a monthly progress meeting for arriving at the end of the six months to a common outcome. 
outcome, you have to consider this outcome as something of really concrete, a position paper, a white paper, a joint paper, to conference, a proof of concept, a communication material. The idea is to start with the first iteration very soon, uh, at the end of this month or in July, uh, for continuing for the following six months with the next uh, slide with the digital transformation data sharing spaces uh, topic. Next one. Uh, OpenDI can contribute to these uh, task forces also with practical tools uh, who is going to develop uh, starting from November 2020 onwards. I'm referring to Pilot's dashboard, reference architecture for cross-domain digital transformation and a benchmarking tool. Next. But uh, will support also uh, this uh, uh, cross-domain collaboration with organization of webinars. We already started with a series of uh, webinars carried out uh, in the past weeks, uh, very successful with uh, an average of 150 attendees. Most uh, of you who are here today uh, probably uh, attended uh, uh, some of these uh, webinars and we are going to start also with a newsletter for increasing awareness and support uh, our initiatives and yours. Next slide. And uh, now I would like just to close my presentation introducing in some way the topic of next session which is open calls. So um, we uh, uh, identified a possible collaboration among domains. Uh, all uh, ecosystem projects who before who later on have open calls in their mission uh, and uh, usually more than uh, one cycle. So uh, investigating in all the domains, we understood that uh, probably a discussion on this topic can be of uh, interest for all the parties. So the idea is to start now with the assessment of the uh, open calls published in COVID-19 uh, period for uh, starting uh, a discussion among the parties where we put problems, knowledge, ideas uh, together in a cross-domain working group uh, which uh, can be stable in the future uh, for facing uh, such topic um, uh, under different points of view. At the beginning, including all only uh, agri-food and manufacturing and opening to energy and healthcare in the future. The idea is not in, a, in any case to substitute to the experts already present in all uh, the ecosystem projects uh, on open course. The idea is to be uh, a sort of green line on the, on the topic uh, for collecting, collecting questions, answers, uh, European Commission guidelines, but also for valorizing winners of such calls, giving them visibility and were required by the single projects, increasing the open course advertising also through the uh, website of uh, uh, OpenDI. We have our, uh, already drafted uh, a, an area uh, specific for this. So I finished my presentation and uh, in the last slide you can find the contact uh, for uh, any information. Thank you. Great. Thank you very, very much, Marianne. A very, very informative. Now we're just going to move on to the overview of Cascade funding and the opportunities that present themselves to participate or become new partners within these particular projects. So the first presenter uh, this afternoon then is Miguel Conclaves from F6S. And Miguel is a European Projects Manager for F6S, which is the largest tech founder community. He connects founders to cascade funding opportunities. In Demeter, he is the Open Call Manager and will present the funding opportunities the project has to offer to SMEs and to other institutes. Miguel? Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, just to confirm if you can see my screen. Yes, I can see your screen. I can hear you very well as well. Perfect. Thank you very much. So I'm very happy to join you and share with you the funding opportunities within the Demeter's project. So um, the goal and the purpose here on the open calls is to enable, in one hand, the extension of Demeter's technology offer uh, beyond consortium partners, and in the other hand, to enlarge the outreach of the large case pilots uh, by supporting the deployment of new pilots in different geographic regions. So that's why we have two uh, open calls within the project. So the first one, uh, called Developed, uh, uh, has the goal to enlarge uh, the pool of agro-interoperable uh, 
technologies by engaging um, uh, tech SMEs. So we are not looking for consortiums here, we are looking for SMEs uh, to integrate their solution within the Demeter ecosystem. And this uh, call uh, should be launched uh, this year, uh, maybe in September, as the date is to be confirmed, but it will be this year for sure. The second open call has a different purpose, it's called uh, Deploy. And uh, the goal is to deploy geographic uh, distributed uh, small-scale pilots that demonstrate the impact uh, and potential of Demeter's approach uh, towards the digitalizing and boosting European agribusiness in the other geographic regions. And here we are looking for um, consortiums to implement those, uh, those pilots. And this call should be uh, launched uh, next year. So I'm going to focus on the first uh, open call to be launched, to uh, develop, and which is the main characteristic are uh, to have a, a total budget of 300,000 uh, euros uh, to be split among um, eight uh, to 12 uh, projects, to SMEs. Uh, there will be a funding up to uh, 30,000 for each uh, SME. And we expect um, the project to be run uh, for a, a collaboration between the selected SMEs and the Debitors project for a period of six months. And we are talking about equity free funding, 100% uh, equity free funding on this call. So, but uh, please be aware that uh, this could be uh, still subject to change, but that's the information that we have defined now. And so, for this first open call, uh, and here is also subject to changes, but this is what we have uh, now to, to, to share with you at this moment. We have selected six challenges uh, that we want um, the, the SMEs to help us with. So the first one is crop selection. We want to help farmers to decide which crop has the best uh, characteristic to be planted in a certain area. Uh, the challenge number two is soil workability and humidity. So here the goal is to help farmers to know if the ground is strong enough to support the weight of a machine and assess soil humidity after rain. The challenge number three is farm management information system enablers. So here we want to help farmers to deliver information requested by public administrations and also to increase their content and quality of the data that they get from their equipment. Challenge number four is agriculture hardware interoperability. We want here to help the farmers to make machinery interoperate and talk uh, between each other, uh, led by uh, Isobus uh, protocol. The challenge number five is the blockchain solution. So we want uh, when you know that blockchain uh, can have a, a disruptive impact in all sectors, and agri-food is not an exception. So we want to help farmers to uh, access a blockchain-based solution for agriculture, agricultural applications such as traceability, commodity trading, uh, machinery uh, management, vehicle management, equipment management, etc. So we want also uh, to have SMEs helping us on this challenge. And last one, challenge uh, number six, uh, business process integration. We want to further help farmers take better decisions based on the data analysis from different data sources. So these are, for now, the six challenges. They may be subject to changes, but uh, the, um, this is a starting point. If we have SMEs here watching this webinar, uh, please uh, uh, take a look at this challenge. And in terms of LGBT criteria, we are looking for SMEs within the European Commission definition of SME. Uh, the applicants should be established in a European uh, Union member state or associated country and they should be working on the development, integration, and interoperability of technological products or services in the agri-food sector. Uh, there will be uh, criteria, of course, to uh, evaluate the applications based on the alignment with the project, the excellence of the, of the solutions uh, proposed, their impact, and the value for money uh, that they propose on the applications. In terms of process and how to, to apply there will be the proposal will be submitted on the platform F Success, an SO3 process to submit your application. Then there will be an eligibility check at the end of the open call uh, time frame. Uh, and if the, the applications are eligible, there will be a remote evaluation made by the evaluators, an online interview, and also a consensus meeting to select the, uh, the final press elections uh, uh, SMEs. 
uh, that then we will start a um, due diligence process uh, in order to start the signature of the sub guarantee agreement. And when we have uh, that ready, that should be uh, in the February of 2021, there will the, the work per se will start uh, with the, divided uh, in the three sprints. So the all, all uh, time, in, time frame will be six months divided in three sprints uh, of two months each. And the funding we all provided will be also split uh, between those three sprints. So 30% funding in the first sprint, 30 in the second sprint, and 40 in the third sprint. So please, uh, as I said, uh, there's a lot of things that can be a fine tune, so please stay uh, tuned to uh, Dimitri's website and newsletter, etc., uh, to uh, be the first to know about the launch of open calls. Uh, regarding open call two, uh, called deployed, I just have uh, one quick slide about this one. So the main characteristics: we have a, a bigger budget for that one, uh, seven hundred thousand euros. The budget will be, could be up to uh, 150,000 for each project, and we are looking here for uh, consortiums. Uh, we will be able to fund uh, between four and eight projects for a duration of 12 months. And uh, as I said, we are looking for a small consortium of three to two to three partners, representing at least uh, one tech provider or integrator and an end user. And we should be opening this call in June uh, 2021. So, but this still may be subject to change for the so the main message here is to and the, the diagram is is more or less the the same. So the application process will be will be the, the same. Uh, but please stay tuned uh, to our communication channels to uh, be the first to know about the open call opportunities that we are here presenting today. And I'm hoping for any question. I think at the end of this section. Thank you very much. Hi, Miguel. We actually do have one question for you, which is, um, are the research institutes eligible as full partners for the Demeter Open Call? For the first one, no. For the second one, we are looking for uh, institutions, yes. So the first one is only for um, SMEs. The second one for uh, institutions, it could be scientific institution, etc. We are looking for uh, all type of institution. Uh, they cannot be uh, part of the um, the beneficiaries of the Dimitri consortium. So we have to be outside to just because of a, a conflict of interest. So if you are in a dedication or a scientific institution outside the, um, the Dimitri consortium, you can apply to the second open call. Great. Thank you very, very much, Miguel. Again, just to let people know that you can post your questions in the dashboard um, and if you can put either Miguel or Tamara or Harold's or um, Sasha's names in front of the questions um, as to the person you'd like the question posed to. Um, again, we're just giving a quick overview of the Cascade Funding Opportunities and the next presenter is Tamara Nedinova from AZU. Um, and Tamara is a project manager at AZO and she has comprehensive experience in creating and development, developing innovation ecosystems. And Tamara has helped over 400 founders start and build their businesses with individual business supports. Within the Atlas project, she is responsible for open calls and the overall coordination and will present an overview of the Atlas open calls. Thank you, Tamara. I can see your um, screen. Yes, great. Uh, can you see the presentation? Yes, and I can hear you as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hazel, for, for the lovely introduction. Uh, thank you, everyone. I'm very glad to, to be here in such a great uh, webinar uh, when you can hear about two projects at the same time. So um, I'm here to uh, walk you through uh, the information about our open calls. You can see some similarities that we have with the Meteor project, um, but some uh, differences as well. So um, I'm aiming to uh, quickly cover a few uh, very common questions we receive uh, regarding our open calls. And first of all, uh, what is the Atlas open call? So we will have two open calls and you already heard uh, today quite some, some information about the technical part of our project about the uh, service architecture of Atlas platform. So we are uh, looking for um, innovative services and solutions that will be built on our platform and uh, will be useful and usable by um, end users, uh, mainly farmers and 
uh, also other players in the agricultural industry. So you can see now the timeline of the first open call. Uh, the first open call is up and running and the deadline is on the 15th of September. So we are looking for your, uh, to your proposals. And uh, so after the database will be closed, um, the um, evaluation starts. Our experts board will evaluate um, your proposals in two um, phases, uh, so to say. So in the uh, second phase, when uh, if your company is shortlisted, you will have an opportunity to answer uh, experts' questions in a live session. And then uh, we will um, conclude contracts with um, winning proposals and uh, you will have six months uh, time to implement your solution. After the implementation period, we are planning uh, a big event, uh, hopefully offline event, um, yeah, when we, uh, when we present all the applications and all the solutions in our um, broad network. Um, so, uh, who is it for? So, uh, we also looking for um, solutions that are um, submitted by SMS uh, to be eligible for our open call. Uh, in other words, you have to be small or mid-sized uh, enterprise and registered in one of EU member states or Horizon 2020 associated countries. So to see the list of the eligible countries, you can also register in our database and uh, that's a very straightforward way or you can uh, look up in the Horizon um, uh, page. So why we think that our um, open call is uh, attractive for you, why you should participate? Um, we have several benefits and uh, the main of them are you will receive the EU funding. Uh, so the average cash contribution um, into your solution will be uh, about 52,000 uh, and you have to come up with 30% of your own contribution uh, on top of that amount. So we are not looking uh, for your cash contribution, so it can be any in-kind service your time you spend on uh, implementation of the application or equipment you already have and you will use for the implementation. So the uh, entire budget of each per each use case uh, we see 75,000. So you will also become a part and will benefit from our uh, extensive network. Uh, you probably saw that we have 30 partners in our consortium um, scientific partners, industry uh, players and end users. So that's a huge expertise uh, inside our consortium. So you will become uh, part of it and you will receive a mentor that will help you to implement your solution and you will uh, be able to interact with, with end users um, anytime you need to and you will have access to all our testing facilities and innovation hubs. So, um, uh, just one quick word, so, as you see, we, we are aiming to fund up to 20 uh, companies uh, within two rounds. First open call is this year and next open call will be also next year. Um, yes, so that's the conditions. So, how to apply? We created a nice video, uh, but I'm not going to show it today, um, so you can see it. Uh, when you enter our uh, web page, that's the first link. When you click the first link, then uh, you will see uh, all the conditions, uh, answers to your questions. You can see our terms of participation and application template. Don't be scared uh, by our long application template. We just broke down all the sections uh, into smaller questions to help you to write a winning proposal. Uh, so, um, and uh, also following the second link, you can uh, directly register into our database and you will be notified about, uh, excuse me, and you will be notified about all um, um, significant um, information or messages or changes um, in our open calls. So we have seven uh, challenges in our first open call. The um, uh, broad description you can find on the web page um, uh, mentioned above. 
So um, if uh, you have more than one solution, you are free to apply for uh, to, to submit your you know, proposals to many um, topics and challenge, or challenges. Um, but uh, keep in mind that you are only allowed to submit one solution per one topic. So um, if you have if, if you have a solution that might feed to several uh, challenges, you have to choose one. Or if you are not sure to which challenge uh, your solution fits uh, the best, you can uh, choose the last one. It's an open uh, topic. So um, that's strange that I can't can't move on to my last slide. Just one minute left, night tomorrow. As you just have one oh. slide left. Right. Yeah, that's one slide left, but I can't. Um, I can't see it. Uh, sorry for that. Thank you. Oh, sorry for that. Yes. Um, oops. Uh, yes, basically that's uh, that's uh, very quick. Um, you can see the preliminary schedule of our webinars that we uh, created to address uh, the most common uh, questions we receive from the potential participants. So uh, if, if you follow uh, any of our channels or uh, register in our database, you can um, uh, receive invitation to this uh, webinars, and you also are free, uh, are welcome to submit any of your questions via the uh, email address you see. So thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to your questions and also to your proposals, of course. Great, Tamara, thank you very, very much for that comprehensive uh, presentation on the Atlas Open Call. My Next, pleasure. we'll Harold uh, Sudamakur from uh, TB, or ATB, my apologies, Harold, from Smart AgriHubs. He's the senior researcher at ATB Institute for Applied Systems Technology in Bremen. And since 1998, he has worked as a scientific staff member at ATB in consultancy and research projects. He's involved in both national research and international research programs, and his research interests relate to digital innovation, IoT, mobile, and collaborative work within the different business domains. Today he's going to present on the Smart Agri Hubs project, and uh, he coordinates the open calls for this. Thank you, Harold. So excellent! Thank you very much. Welcome to my presentation. I'm very happy to present to you the uh, Smart Agri Hubs open call. Uh, we are here for network expansion by open call and for digital innovation. And uh, thank you very much to the uh, speakers before me especially about the project CIMITA Atlas and the challenges they highlighted. I think exactly those are the topics we are also addressing with Smart AgriHubs. And uh, when we are looking um, towards uh, digital transformation or digital innovation in agri-food, of course, we are talking about what we are always saying about sensing, analysis, planning and control. I think these are basic paradigms. And uh, at the very end, what was also highlighted before, it's about decision making of business and consumers. It's also about food integrity. It is about public decision making, about different aspects which we are experiencing, even cross domain, cross sectorial aspects. And last but not least, about a bunch of technologies uh, for being able to do digital innovation. Therefore, what is Smart AgriHubs about? It's a project with 168 partners. Uh, what we want to facilitate, to, to support, it's about digital innovation in the agri-food uh, sector, meaning um, we want to facilitate the setup of digital innovation hubs, of competence centers. How can we provide uh, regional uh, topical support in those areas? So I don't go on all the characteristics of the project, but also in Smart AgriHubs, we have uh, 28 uh, innovation experiments, as we are calling them, to learn uh, how, to, uh, how to do good, what are the challenges in digital innovation. And at the same time, we're organizing now several open calls uh, in enabling this. And in, in this perspective, we think the digital innovation hubs are playing a key role. And possibly you are not so familiar with digital innovation hubs yet, um, that's uh, the perspective of a regional network offering service for digital innovation for the different target audiences. So I think I could talk a long time also just about digital innovation hubs, but just to highlight that because therefore I was putting the next slide uh, where I wanted to say, yes, we want to uh, learn how can we really facilitate innovation experiments. On the one hand, regionally, 
via this perspective of digital innovation hubs so that they are coaching innovation experiments. Innovation experiments as well as also previously today was introduced uh, by a multi-actor approach, uh, bringing together end users, technology providers and, and all the different stakeholders which are in this game. And at the same time, we have uh, networks of competence centers, really about topics, aiming at knowledge transfer, and how can we really make such a network grow, work, uh, and even build it up, expand it. And that's specifically the idea of our open calls. Um, there are certain open call characteristics uh, you have here on the slides. Uh, our funding in the moment is mainly targeted at digital innovation hubs, while finally also towards SMEs, uh, end users, and so on. But, uh, well, uh, just to highlight here that it's about, at the very end, about innovation experiments. How can really end users and technology providers get support by digital innovation hubs, being coached by uh, competence centers, and how can we make this work also on the long run? So that's the strategic objective. And uh, the basic idea, uh, of us was to make three kind of open call phases, especially now with the background of COVID-19, we really more or less uh, throw away our initial planning and really set up a completely new uh, approach. And now we said respond, restart and expand. So the, the respond phase is already closed. We had two open calls for this uh, closed on June 3rd. However, now in July, we are planning to open the restart and expand phases. Um, also a little bit with the background of COVID-19 and therefore now the restart, the system as we called it, it's a, for digital innovation hubs planning to realize hackathon type of activities like challenges or also data tons and um, also that 20 percent of total budget of activities will be funded so that's the idea but uh, i think uh, for the sake of time i will give you some references on this and we have uh, already there some documents that there you can read about certain details and also the expand the network this is really for the let's say proposals um, offered by uh, digital innovation hubs, which are planning to support innovation experiments. So that's the logic of those calls in principle, and uh, that we can really learn what, how can we facilitate uh, digital innovation in the regions via topics uh, and have a real network where we see also a bridge, let's say communication, collaboration over sectors, over regions and over topics. Therefore, that's more or less the planning in the moment uh, of the restart open call. It will, like the expands, we are planning early July, at least in the moment we are still planning this. And then it will be opened until uh, July 2021. So this call will be open one year or around this. And it's a continuous open call or continuous submission scheme. So you can submit your proposal whenever you think it's appropriate. And uh, we are planning in the moment to have batch evaluation. So every month we are evaluating proposals and uh, based on thresholds uh, to keep uh, a required quality level, uh, we will then fund uh, proposals accordingly. So that is our current plan. Well, we must say the last open calls, as I said, we had the, res uh, the, the respond phase where we received over 100, so 110 proposals we received and we're there in the moment currently in the evaluation. Uh, so in those two open calls, so, and we must say it was uh, very good ideas, a lot of uh, good proposals we received and we're now in the, really in the middle of the evaluation and also participants and proposals are getting very soon uh, some information on that. Coming to information, uh, you see on this slide, uh, you will see some yeah, outline of the latest open call on our website. Of course, the website Smart Agri Hubs is the place to go. There you also have uh, open call documents, uh, possibly to, do, to download them. There you can still download the respond 
open call documents uh, and we have a program document. This is a kind of like a work program because we said, well, there we are presenting our basic ideas and strategies, definition, eligibility and so on. I think just summarizing everything in one document. This might be an interesting reading for you if you would already to uh, know more. And then we also have a question and answer section in this Smart AgriHub's Innovation Forum. You can register there, just registering for, let's say, uh, talking there with your email address and uh, or with your identification that you can let's say post there some comments and questions so if you have also questions after this presentation please also go to the forum we are also checking this daily and we can uh, also answer your uh, question there in the public so it's a public forum and there is al already a lot of questions and communication done before and last not but least uh, we also have webinars resources you can also go there in our portal to the training sections to learn more about smart agri hubs so thank you very much also to the colleagues from atlas and demeter for organizing this webinar quite a challenge always and to all of you participating in this webinar thank you very much for listening it was a pleasure joining here and uh, yeah looking forward uh, to further questions great. possibly especially offline then thank you so much great thank you very very much harold and uh, i'd just like to commend you on the the respond um call as well it was a, a really a brilliant way to mobilize the network of smart agri hubs and it was it's great to see that the numbers for those applications are very very high so so well done yeah. Um, so, also, thanks. just to let you know that um, we're the regional cluster lead for Ireland in the UK, and as Harold said, I would encourage anybody who's a digital innovation hub in Orpio or a competency centre to register on the Smart Agri Hubs portal. And Harold is very responsive there with regards to questions, but also any of the other open calls uh, from Atlas, Agro, Book Food, and otherwise, they're all promoted and uh, published there as well at different stages. Thank you very much, Harold, Thank for you. presenting. Um, and we actually just do have one quick question, um, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, how can SMEs get involved in the call? Is that, is that question coming in on your dashboard, Harold? Uh, sorry. No, I think, could you repeat the question, please? Yes. Um, so they're just asking, how can SMEs get involved in the Smart Agri Hubs open call? Yes, thank you very much for the question. Uh, in the, I must say, in the respond open call, we had a pan-European challenge, especially for SMEs coming up with uh, implementations. More or less, we organized a challenge. We're in the middle of this challenge. Um, in the upcoming open calls, the restart, restart and expand phase, there it's more or less in the second step because what we want to have is we want to have proposals by digital innovation hubs that they are regionally organizing this digital innovation. And at the very end, it's also for SME startups, end users, technology providers and users, and they can uh, provide their uh, or perform their innovation experiments, as we are calling it. And therefore, I think it's key also to collaborate with digital innovation hubs. And that's also, I think, the place to go for SMEs and startups. And uh, the digital innovation hubs can there uh, can be a really door opener for collaboration, for learnings, for coaching. And I would recommend, especially in this phase of Smart Agri Hubs, that if you're an SME a startup and you want to do, uh, there are some projects also in collaboration with this uh, large team in behind Smart Agri Hubs. As I said, we are already from the beginning, we were 168 partners and it's growing. And if you see there in the Smart Agri Hubs portal uh, about the map, uh, also the number of uh, digital innovation hubs competence center is really growing and we really appreciate it. And it's Exactly, it's about networking. It's a, about a lot of people which are really uh, aiming to support uh, SMEs, also large organizations, large end users, small end users. So uh, I think that's the place to go. Great, thank you very, very much, Harold. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll now move on to the last presentation. We do have one or two other questions, but I will put them to um, the panel um, for open calls, if that's okay, at the end. So our next pre uh, presentation is from Sasha. Stovak Roski.
I'm sorry, I apologize in advance, Stasha. I think you're the only surname that I was really stumbling with when I was uh, looking at these names yesterday, so my apologies. Uh, she's from the Biosense Institute and she's involved in agrogo food. Stasha works in the Biosense Institute, focusing primarily on building the ag tech startup ecosystem in Siberia and the region. She's the deputy coordinator of the Horizon 2020 project, Agrogo Food. She's a work package leader for the Open Call Management and regional cluster leader for Central East Europe in this particular project. In addition, she's involved in several other Cascade funding projects that offer support to entrepreneurs and innovators in the field. And Stasha also manages the Biosense Accelerator for ag tech startups and works on establishing long-term collaborations between industry partners researchers and SMEs. Stasha will present today on the Agrobo Food Open Course. Thank you, Stasha. Thank you, Hazel. No worries about the name. Um, it tends to be complicated. Um, so my name is Stasha. I hope everyone can hear me and see my screen. Um, yes, thank you, Hazel, for the, for the nice introduction. Uh, and indeed, I will be speaking on behalf of uh, AgroboFood. As Hazel said, uh, I will be presenting the AgroboFood Open Call. Um, and currently, um, we are involved uh, in the Open Call on Innovation Experiment that is ongoing. Uh, but I will also give you a brief overview of the project itself. Um, AgroboFood is one of the Horizon 2020 projects that offers funding to third parties. And thank you, everyone, for inviting us to also present the possibilities here. Um, the vision of AgroboFood is quite uh, ambitious. Um, what we are hoping to do throughout the duration of the project is to establish a truly pan-European network of digital innovation hubs, but not just any digital innovation hubs. We are focused on those that are developing uh, robotic solutions for the agri-food sector, that are willing to demonstrate the applicability of robotics uh, in this field, um, and that uh, are devoted to truly digitalizing um, and roboticizing this sector um, that is still somewhat um, not keeping up with, with other industries um, in the field. The concept and the way we see it uh, is that the digital innovation hubs become one-stop shops uh, with a portfolio of, of services and companies at close distance, meaning that if they don't necessarily offer a certain service, they know who to connect you with, um, and that these services truly uh, enhance the, the digitization and robotization of, of the sector. We want to demonstrate the value of robotics so that those interested in applying robotics um, can truly um, see why that's important, uh, how they can benefit and, and what the outcomes can be. Uh, and we want to build this ecosystem and, and grow the ecosystem uh, in, in that sense. Uh, but today the focus is on open calls. And as I've said, currently we have one going, but in total there will be three open calls um, in AgroboFood, um, one that started on March and we have an extended deadline due to COVID-19 as the call closes on September 1st. Then we will have another one for innovation experiments um, which will uh, be launched in January next year um, and you will have time until March to apply. And in the meantime, in between, we will have a call for industrial challenges that will be launched in October um, and uh, finished in January. Since today I'll focus primarily on innovation experiments, just a, a short note on, on the difference. With innovation experiments, we are looking for consortia uh, and our a set of topics is very broad uh, as long as it fits uh, into the agri-food value chain, whereas it, with industrial challenges, we will be looking for single applicants and the topics will be developed uh, together with industry experts. Um, so the, the topics will be much more narrow, more uh, as a, a case study thing, and there will be a stronger interaction with the industry compared to the, to the experiments. So as I said, uh, we are already in, in the phase of receiving applications for, for the first open call, um, and you still have plenty of time to apply um, in case this is the first time you're hearing about this, or this is the time when you're considering this. The, um, for the open call uh, on innovation experiments is 2.65 million euros. So it's quite a large budget and we are uh, giving up to half a million euros uh, to the selected experiments. This amount is then split among the members of the consortia. So uh, depending on whether it's two or five partners. And then there is also a limitation in the budget per partner that can be 
fifty to three thousand uh, three thousand euros. Uh, we will probably be funding approximately six projects. This will be dependent uh, both on the budgets asked uh, and on the on the quality of the proposals received. Um, but these are some of our targets. Uh, what is the timeline? Uh, the open call started on March 1st, and now we're in the phase of collecting applications and uh, answering all your questions. On September 1st, the open call will officially end, and that is when we will start the evaluation process. Uh, the evaluation will be a two-stage uh, process, so uh, it will last for two months. Uh, this means that shortlisted candidates uh, will also be invited for an interview with uh, external evaluators who are doing the whole evaluation process and then in November we will have information about those that are selected and we will start signing contracts. Uh, the experiments will begin in, in December 2020 and finish in April 2022, so they will last for quite a while. Um, and I will also talk briefly about the implementation timeline since we're talking about agri-food value chain uh, and people tend to, to get um, uh, upset about the, the winter season and summer season, they will, there will be time to cover everything. Um, who is eligible? So who are we looking for? Uh, as I said earlier, it's two to five partners. Uh, the consortium need to have one end user and one technology provider at least. What this means is that uh, depending on the role the different SMEs will take in the, in the proposal and later on in the implementation of the project, at least one needs to be the one designing and developing the robotic technology and the other one needs to be the one who will be actually using and showing how this technology is being used. Um, you, you can of course have several of these roles and, and have a different combination, these are the minimums. The solution has to be based on robotic technology um, and our uh, take on robotics is quite broad. We have a definition on, on the website. Uh, it needs to address the problem in the agri-food sector as you see it and one thing that we uh, are trying to establish uh, which is now part of the eligibility criteria is that you need to have contact with the regional, regional digital innovation hub. So as Hazel said in the introduction, I am for example coordinating the regional cluster for Central East Europe and anyone from these countries should have uh, a contact with me before applying in order for us to know what's happening and be able to support you in developing your application. Uh, your idea, uh, this is also a bit related to the uh, later on evaluation criteria, not only needs to be on the topic as I described, but uh, needs to focus on two important things. One is that it needs to be technically sound uh, and you need to show us the innovation in your solution, but it also needs to have a business side to it. So you need to have a business model that really shows a potential to enter the market. Um, we, we are looking at the broader sustainability uh, picture with agriculture being one of the um, polluters and we want to see this. We, want, we are hoping for a high di and a diverse uh, geographical coverage, meaning countries that are not already part of the Agrobo Food Network uh, and the partners who are implementing it need to show us that they are really capable of executing the task at hand. Uh, so uh, what do you need to do? You need to go to the Agrobo Food Innovation Portal uh, and read all the documents. Uh, Harald also mentioned this for uh, Smart Agri Hubs. There is a list of documents that are uh, open call documents that can guide you through the process. Then you need to find your partners uh, for the consortium. They need to either be cross-border, so international, or cross-sectoral. So for example, if somebody has been developing robotic technologies for the healthcare sector and now thinks that certain components could be used in agriculture, that would be already considered cross-sectoral. So either or, you can also do both. Then you need to start planning your idea and finally submitting all the documents before the deadline. Some of the documents you will find on the website are the cold fish, the guide for applicants, which is the most detailed and uh, important document the proposal template in which you will uh, fill your application and then these are some uh, additional um, administrative forms like the SME declaration and consortium declaration, uh, declaration of honor and bank account information. Uh, one thing I did not mention explicitly is that this call is targeting SMEs, um, so in that sense that is why we have all these um, SME oriented documents. And just uh, a few words on the implementation phase as I've said. Uh, even though we start uh, already in, in the winter or in December, uh, it's not to worry uh, and you will have time for the proper agricultural season. 
first we start with the design phase that will last for about three months, which is when you focus on your milestones and uh, the proper process of your um, uh, implementation of the experiment. Then you enter the eight months process of develop uh, phase, which means building the technical solution, testing it in the field, validating it. Um, so as you can see, this actually gets you the summer and spring and even part of the autumn season. And then uh, as that finishes and you have your results, you enter the market phase where you're most more focused on uh, entering the market, promoting your product, finding customers, and so on. Upon successful completion of each of these phases, uh, you submit deliverables that are being reviewed by independent experts, and then once those are approved, you receive uh, subsequent funding. So 30, 40, and then 30% uh, of the funding is, is released. Uh, if you want to apply, you can either go to the Agroba Food website or you can contact me directly. Uh, I'm there for you uh, for any questions. There is also quite a thorough FAQ section on the website as we've been updating it with the questions we receive. Um, so don't hesitate to look at that. And if somebody is not potentially interested in uh, applying for the open calls, there are other ways that you can join our network, uh, such as joining the network of digital innovation hubs and competence centers, uh, checking with us what services we offer, what services you potentially want to develop. And there are different ways of, for collaboration and you can find more information on the website, even a, an application form to officially register as a, as a DIH or a CC. Uh, that would be it for me. I hope I didn't uh, break the time uh, and I'm, as I said, at your disposal for, for any further questions. Great. Thank you very, very much for that, Stasha. Really, really informative presentation. And as I said earlier on, and as you had quite rightly said, depending on who is within your region. And so as an example, again, that we're the we're involved in the Northwest Europe region in agrobal food as well. So just reach into all of the different region contact points and they'll give you a lot of information as well but there's a huge uh, amount of information on each of these websites and um, i might just um call back uh, miguel and tomorrow unfortunately harold um had to step out and um, but i just have just two quick questions for each of the projects if you wouldn't mind uh, just bear with me just for one second um, so maybe uh, to you first miguel if that's okay and um, sure. everybody just Kind of get an understanding of how many projects potentially will be funded um, across Demeter and then what is the success rate um, on those particular applications and I'll be putting the same question to uh, Stasha from Agrobo Food and to Tamara from Atlas as well. Okay so in the first open call of Demeter we are looking between uh, 8 and 12 SMEs to be selected. Uh, and on the second uh, open call, we are targeting uh, consortiums uh, of two, three entities, and we are uh, hoping to select, uh, it depends, but, uh, between uh, five and six projects. And uh, the, um, the rate of uh, selected applicants, uh, we don't know uh, yet. We will see, I expect to have a lot of success in the applications. Uh, like other projects in this uh, sector have uh, been uh, successful also with more than a thousand uh, applications uh, but uh, we will see we, will, we never know thank you very very much miguel tamara yes um as i mentioned we are aiming to fund up to 20 uh, projects if you find more solutions uh more interesting solutions and uh, they will be within our budget then we will fund a little bit more uh so that will be funded uh into two rounds this year and next year there um, hasn't to be um uh, the equal distribution of the project per each open call so it might be five project this year and 15 next year and vice versa so that's uh uh, and what was the the second part of uh, what's the evaluation criteria or and the success rate of the applicants? I suppose that's a difficult question to answer in the sense that you don't actually know the success rate until you know how many applicants you have versus how many projects you can actually fund. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, so oh, we we are really looking for for bright, interesting ideas, and uh, yeah. So we just started. It's too early to say. Perfect. And just um, one quick question as well, I suppose it's for all the candidates, and I will come to you then, Stash, if that's okay. Is, uh, startups, are they eligible to apply for open calls as well? I know we've talked a lot about SMEs, 
and but I'm assuming they're eligible as well. Yes, for Atlas, yes, uh, startups, uh, they, have, they have to be registered anyways. Uh, um, okay. Also agricultural companies, if it's uh, farmers, if it's end users themselves, so we also welcome their proposals. Mm -hmm. Uh, same for same for a grub of food, and I would even say that the SME term is really broad in terms of how the European Commission defines it. So make sure you check the guide. I guess that all the projects have it uh, somewhere at least with a link to the SME guide of the European Commission, um, and uh, it all really depends on the on the turnover rate and the number of employees uh, primarily. So many uh, entities that are for profit entities fall under this category. Thank you very, very much for your presentation this afternoon. I'm now going to hand over to Kevin Doolin just to close today's webinar. Um, Kevin, are you there? Yeah. Great, we can see you now. Hello. Hi, Kevin. Oh, yeah, thanks, Hazel. Um, I'll be very brief because I know, I know we've gone over time. Um, just want to say thanks to all our presenters. I think it's been a a really informative day all around, you know, starting with details on technology developments and then looking at how we adopt and use those types of technologies and then finishing off showing how other organizations can get on board as well. So it's not we're not a closed shop. We're very much open to, to new organizations joining us. Um, I, do, I think it was a very good event and um, we look forward to doing another one in maybe a year or so. And thanks again, Hazel, for, for chairing. Great job. You're very welcome, Kevin. Uh, so that will bring to a close then uh, today's webinar on Horizon 2020 Agritech Research in Europe. Um, I'd like to also thank uh, Gornia and Deirdre for doing all the background work and actually bringing this webinar together. Um, we had a lot of content today, and, and as I said, it's all being recorded. But from my personal perspective, I have to say, I think it's a really, really exciting period of time ahead for agri-tech research right across Europe. And it's definitely something that everybody should be um, really, really watching and, and uh, watching through different projects like Smart Agri Hubs as well. Um, and we look forward to hopefully seeing you all in the next webinar. Thank you very, very much.